So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. SERPI is here for you. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now. Social Economic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovative Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat mo munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ng batas, pag-aralan mo na gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication 
and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mababatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay piyagaralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. 
Therapy has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Surfy now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. This is the PIDS webinar series where we teach our policy studies and the insights of government policymakers and program implementers, industry experts and practitioners, scholars, and civil society actors. For this webinar series, which we started in 2020, we hope to provide an accessible venue for evidence-based discussion of current and emerging development issues. I'm Sheila C.R., and I will be your moderator. Friends, our topic for today is about the implementation of the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Act of 2012, also known as the RPRH law. Nearly 10 years after it was passed, it is worth revisiting how it was carried out by the agencies tasked to implement it, as well as by our local government units, which play a critical role in the delivery of RPRH services. What are the issues that the new administration should address to achieve the law's main goal of universal access to responsible parenthood services and reproductive health care? Let us find out in our discussion today. So officially open our virtual event and give us more information about today's topic. I now give the floor to our president at PIDS, Dr. Anisato Arbeta Jr. Sir? Thank you, Sheila. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging the presence of the following who choose to be with us this afternoon uh, from government. Uh, we have uh, Department of Education Under Secretary Jusdan San, San Antonio, National Council on Disability Affairs Deputy Executive Director Mateo Lee Jr., Department of Foreign Affairs uh, Office of European Affairs Assistant Director Charlson Himusura, National Economic Development Authority Assistant Regional Director Dolores Molintas. From the academe, uh, let, let me acknowledge uh, Kagayan State uh, University Director Christian uh, Lara. From CSO's NGOs, INGOs, we have uh, Swilig Family Foundation Executive Director Austir Panadero and Director Dori Lin. Uh, Roots of Health Director Shiri Ann Abel. Villa Gracia and Deputy Director Marcos Suanopel. Uh, Integrated Midwives Association of the Philippines Incorporated Executive Director Patricia Gomez. International uh, Planned Parenthood Federation East and Southeast Asian uh, Region Director Gisin Lucas. Unahakbang Foundation Incorporated President Oli Lucas. Uh, Democratic so Socialist Women of the Philippines National Chairperson Elizabeth Asyonko. Barangay Atipulan, Puluan, uh, OFW Association President Lillian Mati, Barangay Zone 12A, OFW Association President Merlin Bako. 
let me also greet our friends from the media. And uh, finally, let me also greet our guests, colleagues from government, academia, civil society, media, private sector, and those watching to the PIDS and SERPI Facebook pages. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. As Sheila has mentioned, today we will talk about the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Law. In, in 2012, the Philippines passed the Repub Republic Act 10354, or commonly known as RPRH Act. They aim at to educate and empower Filipinos to make choices regarding their reproductive health, improve their lives of families, and promote sustainable human development for the nation. The passing of the laws resulted in several accomplishments. For, for one, the unmet need of family planning methods continue to shrink. Another is the decrease in the adolescent fertility rate in the country. However, despite these developments, the country's performance in other reproductive health outcomes remains weak. The Philippines also lagged behind its low and middle income neighbors. The low as broad uh, scope requires multi-sectoral efforts to improve the health outcomes of the country. This afternoon, we will feature three PIDS studies that look into the RPH implementation in the national level governance, local service delivery, and education and communication. The first study authored by PIDS Senior Research Fellow Valerie Gilbert Olip, a supervising research specialist Jana Oi, uh, research consultants Vanessa C. Van and Joy Bagas analyzed the governance role played by the national government agencies or NGAs to facilitate the implementation of the RPH. RPRH law. Specifically, the paper focused on nine government governance uh, components, namely organizational presence, policy infrastructure, financing, human resources, stewardship, coordination, monitoring and evaluation, and accountability. The second paper, authored by PID Senior Research Fellow Michael Abrigo, uh, research consultant Jerome Patrick Cruz, and research analyst Sandra Tam, focus on delivering mandated services in communities by local government units or LGUs under the RPRH law. The third study, authored by research consultants Mary Pauline Saking and uh, Nor Lisa Nordan, assessed the extent of the RPRH law's implementation of its education mandate, including government education and communication efforts for the RPRH law. Uh, we have Dr. Abrigo, Dr. Saking, and Ms. Oi, who will present in, uh, today's webinar. To enrich the study's finding, we are fortunate to have the inputs of the two NGAs uh, with the most extensive presence in RPRH implementation, the Department of Health, or DOH, and uh, the Commission on Population and Development, or PAPCOM. From the DOH Disease Prevention and Control Bureau, we have uh, Supervising Program Health Officers, Dr. Mara Jean uh, Almasura Miliar and Mr. Kin Raymond Borlin. From PAPCOM, we have Mr. Dugrasa Silvano, Assistant Division Chief of its Planning, Monitoring, and Evaluation Division. He will share insights on how the concerned NGAs and LGUs can improve the delivery of our each services and, and the loss implementation. We are deeply honored to have you in this webinar. I encourage all the participants to stay until the end of the webinar and actively participate in the open forum. Thank you. I now give back the floor to Sheila. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Obeta. So friends, let us now listen to our featured studies on the assessment of the RPRH law. So uh, we will hear first on how it was implemented by national government agencies. And our, per, uh, and our presenter is Ms. Jana Uy. Uh, who is a supervising research specialist at PIDS. Jana has a master's in epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health and a Bachelor of Science in Health Sciences from the Ateneo de Manila University. She primarily serves as an applied epidemiologist working with health sector decision makers in conducting policy research for health system reform and universal health care. Jana, you now have the virtual floor. Hi, thank you, Mom Sheila. I'll just share my slides. Kita na po ba? Okay. Yes, Jana, we can see it. All right. So good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present to you the findings of our study about the national level governance for the RBRH law. Okay. 
So in this presentation, we'll go through this outline. First, uh, a brief refresher on the law and our methods in the study then our key results, and finally, a synthesis and summary of the recommendations we uh, gave to DOH. But before anything else, I'd like to ask the audience to keep in mind that the study covered the years 2014 to 2019. So it's now the year 2022. Our paper was submitted to DOH in 2021. So it really, um, the DOH and RBRH players have received our recommendations, and we're very excited to hear from our discussants later how, how much progress they have made since then, okay? So next slide. So let's start with the background on the law. So RPRH was a landmark law passed in 2012, which presented an important shift in how the Philippine state viewed the role of women, family, and reproductive health, not just in, health, not just in the health sector, but also in poverty alleviation in the socioeconomic development of the country. Particularly, it declared that universal access to reproductive health care services was an instrumental right to life, health, and sustainable development. So the RPRH law covers 12 elements that can be grouped into four thematic areas, which I'll just briefly mention from left to right. The first three elements really cover uh, health system capacity and essential services for mothers and their children, so like family planning and nutrition. The second three cover reproductive health services for, and sexuality education for adolescents and youth. And the next three cover reproduct, reproductive tract disorders and diseases such as HIV and AIDS, cancers, and the prevention and treatment of uh, infertility. And lastly, uh, there is an aspect on gender equality and mental health, which affirms men's roles in reproductive health, mental health, and also protection for uh, women and children. Okay, so in our study, uh, the, the the RPRH law really cuts across sectors. It involves several national agencies. If you read the law, uh, including civil society and even the private sector and multilaterals. The scope of this study, my particular study, is focused on core national agencies mentioned in the RPRH implementing rules. The two presentations after me will cover LGU service delivery and. Uh, delivery in schools of comprehensive sexuality education. So going back to this study, our scope was notably focused on the national agencies, namely core agencies such as the DOH, the lead implementer of the RPRH law, uh, and who coordinates all the other actors across the nation, PhilHealth, who finances the RPRH services in terms of its benefits packages, Popcom, uh, who was made the co-manager of the National Family Planning Program back then, DSWD, who is charged with the mandate of integrating RPRH into social protection programs. DILG, who, who really is the bridge between the national and the local LGUs. And also uh, supporting agencies such as the Philippine Commission of Women, who has mandates in gender mainstreaming national agencies. The DEPED, who is in charge of integrating RPRH into curriculums. So to represent also the civil society or the civil society organization, CSOs, we focus then on the on Likhaan, interviewing Likhaan, who was at that time the secretariat of the CSOs in the national implementation team. And for the donors, we focus on UNFPA, who, who were really heavily involved in providing technical assistance to the national partners at that time, and even today. All right. So overall, this evaluation had the objective to assess whether national governance for RPRH was ex executed cohesively, paying attention to the roles and relationships among the national actors, and also to identify the gaps and challenges in leadership and coordination at the national level. Uh, we define governance here as the exercise of power by RPRH national leaders to manage the implementation uh, and coordinate it strategically to meet the needs of constituents. The evaluation of governance looked particularly into nine components, which is uh, summarized in the figure on the right. The first six, the first box, we looked at six enabling factors. At the center of the enabling factors is really stewardship or the presence of quality leadership to direct the implementation. Uh, this stewardship determines how an agency's, for example, organizational structure, policies, uh, available financing, human resources are allocated or really made responsive, responsive to RPRH mandate. Stewardship is also essential to allocating the human resources and coordinating them within agencies and across agencies to carry out mandates. So 
uh, rallying all these resources allows performance in RPRH, which is the box on the far right, uh, in terms of NGAs fulfilling their mandates for the law. Uh, fulfilling their mandates will theoretically contribute to positive impacts on reproductive health outcomes in the long run. And then in between, the link between performance and enabling factors are really feedback components of accountability and monitoring and evaluation. These will help NGAs improve their operations, decision makings, and hold them answerable to their progress for their mandates. So this is sort of the summary of what we tried to do in this and looked at in this study. Uh, to summarize our methods and how we collected our data and analyzed it, this study was primarily a qualitative uh, study with three main sources of data. First, key informant interviews with national level respondents in involved in governance across the mentioned agencies a while ago. Second, we reviewed a lot of official documents such as the law, implementing rules, the policies produced by these agencies, accomplishment reports, and even the minutes of the meetings of the national implementation team across the years. These were further verified with literature reviews uh, to check whether what our if our findings were consistent with past studies on governance uh, for laws such as this. And uh, we triangulated all this data with three independent researchers working together to synthesize and ar arrive at the consensus of results, uh, identifying patterns that we present in the next section and also preventing bias and subjectivity in our interpretations, all right? So now we go on to the meat of our results on the challenges in governance we found. Uh, for reference, if you need to remind yourself about the definition of the components, they are italicized on the upper right corner in case you need to refer back to them. Okay, we can start. For the first one, uh, we look at performance or the accomplishments of the RPRH national implementation team back then, comparing it to the law and implementing rules. Uh, so what we found is this overall implementation was really focused on individual programs separately with most of the accomplishments being in family planning and adolescent reproductive health. Overall, there was not really an integration then of interventions into a comprehensive package of RPRH services. And looking at the first box on the left, the RPRH elements with sustained uh, nationwide programs for the National Family Planning Program, Safe Motherhood, HIV AIDS, and the elimination of violence and against women and children. But these were really investments or programs built on prior uh, investments that based on, for example, Millennium Development Goals, or there was already an anti-violence against women and children law in 2004. So in the middle box, we, we list here the RPRH elements, which received little to no progress at that time, such as the prescription and management of abortion, RH cancers, male responsibility, uh, and mental health aspects of the RP, RH law. So on the right, on the last box, uh, this is the summary of uh, when we looked at each line in the implementing rules. Uh, generally, agencies fulfilled mandates that did not require coordination across agencies, such as guidelines, policy standards, and actually most of the things that were accomplished back then was, the, the, was DOH tasks on releasing standards and technical guidelines. And partial accomplishments, these were, these were things that were started back then and effort was being put into them, but they were not completed at the time of the study. So those were mandates with inter with interagency coordinations or even within uh, agency coordinations. An example would be uh, establishing family planning services in establishments which would re have required DOH and the DOLE to collaborate. Uh, and the last part, things that were not done were mostly cross-cutting systems, uh, like putting up monitoring for LGU compliance and integrating the RPRH into curriculums. This was very challenging for the agencies back then because there were really many layers of bureaucracy and then really few channels to coordinate between agencies. So the next one, looking at the responsiveness of uh, national agencies to RPRH mandates, how they changed or and, uh, folded RPRH into their organizational structures, Majority of the NGAs interviewed did not really make formal changes to their structures in response to their mandates, but they mostly folded RPRH within existing units that were thematically close. So the trend of not having a focal unit is really understandable in non-DOH agencies, but really was a significant issue within DOH itself. 
So the RPRH uh, Implementing Rules Section 12.01 mandates a unified family health bureau. But at the time, uh, their attempts to create the bureau since 2015 was really hindered by problems with uh, BBM. DOH tried to consolidate their programs into a Women and Men's Health Division and Children's Health Development Division, but the responsibility for RPRH was sort of concentrated into, a, into the Women's Health Division because it had, quote unquote, the most programs that referred to RPRH then. So even support functions were, were fragmented across DOH organizational structures. For example, most of the programs are launched, are launched in the DPCB, but uh, things like logistics are lodged in other clusters with different uh, use sex or assets that really made it difficult for them to coordinate. Uh, and, and just last year, however, DPCB had a major restructuring. So maybe we'll hear about that from our discussions, how they were able to sort of move past this bottleneck with DBM. So at the best practice on the right was really in the DSWB, uh, where RPRH was integrated in an existing gender and, develop and development technical working group. So in this sort of structure, multiple bureaus, both program bureaus and supporting bureaus were included in, in the TWG. They were designated focal persons to handle the matter and their process was uh, somewhat expedited because they report directly to the exacom and, and could skip some part of the chain of command. So this is just a contrast between the DOH and the DSWB. In terms of financing, if you look at the DOH's financing for RPRH back then, it really focused on family planning and maternal health commodities. Looking at the table on the right, table 12 on the top, the largest budget in the DPCB for RPRH was family planning and maternal and child health. 90% of that budget, looking at the table 13 at the bottom, was really for vaccines and commodities for nutrition. We, we really had a hard time finding investments in support infrastructures like information technology, education, advocacy. Uh, and then the, the respondents back then admitted that re they really had limited budget for back end support systems or inputs to even distribute the commodities. Okay. Moreover, the second point, because family planning procurement is lodged in the DOH central office, it became very, very vulnerable to political interference. It had been fairly easy to really uh, remove a big chunk of their budget. For example, in 2016, around 200 million pesos was cut from their budget for implants and contraceptives, and again in 2020. And that's why there was sort of a stock out for implants in 2021. Okay. So lastly, across NGAs and within the implementation team, the national implementation team, there is really no unified financial plan. For example, at that time, DepEd did not have dedicated funding for comprehensive sexuality education, which explained why they had so much delays with uh, piloting the program and rolling it out. For national stewardship and coordination, uh, the, the, the national implementation team is supposed to be the interagency body for implementation. Uh, it was created in 2015 to manage and review policy guidelines and coordinate and monitor actions across uh, national actors. However, when we interviewed the, the national the NIT members, uh, we, we sort of realized that the NIT did not really fulfill its potential as a venue for the interagency coordination. Among the NGA members, while they agreed that it was to be a venue for communication, they were really unclear as to what exactly was to be coordinated. Was it really about policy or operations or even accountability? The lack of clarity uh, was really seen in the NIT meetings because they were focused so much on micro-operational and family planning issues with really little to no discussion and strategy, coordination, cross-national government collaboration. So if you look at the table on the right, you'll see we counted how many of the meetings discussed what aspect. So at the time, uh, 71 of the national meetings uh, we, we, we were able to analyze and more than half of that, they focused on just a few policies reviewing line by line um, and also requesting updates about number of stocks about family planning commodities. Uh, and a lot of these were really something that you could address within agencies outside the NIT or even through emails. So for example, there are a lot of also meetings about whether CSOs would be able to access this or that sort of funding, or how about delays and disbursements, sort of like that. Okay. And then the second is the lack of strategic leadership manifested in the absence of 
uh, strategic plan or framework to operationalize or institutionalize our PRH within and across NGA implementers. So looking at the table of the right, most, which I mean 57% of the 104 policies we were able to analyze, uh, was developed in 2014 to 2015 by the DOH, and they were really implementing guidelines for its own units or LGUs. While they were there, there were eight policies, internal policies within NGAs to direct their implementation and operations. Most really did not pertain to RPRH mandates as a whole. They were mostly programmatic. At this time, only DepEd actually had the internal policy to institutionalize RPRH, talking about which different units had the role and up to the up, up to the school level. Um, and also the focus of, on family planning, the, the maternal health, and the comprehensive sexuality education in NIT meetings contributed to the absence of other agencies and their decision makers in NIT meetings. Because without the strategic agenda, uh, agencies who don't really have a clear purpose and benefit in attending NIT meetings uh, would not really want to go there. So in that sense, the other agencies were underutilized and so sort of contributed to the slow progress in implementation of other elements of the RPRH law. Uh, and lastly, for the links between enabling components and performance, we look at the monitoring aspect. So the lack of strategic, strategic plan resulted in unclear, fragmented monitoring frameworks to measure the progress for RPRH implementation. Well, there was an m &E plan developed in 2014. It really emphasized data collection over utilization. Uh, indicators were focused on programs, not really, they were very broad and there was no ownership. There's no theory of change sort of identifying that the, these actions will, will lead to this or these agencies have a role in this aspect. And the, the focus of monitoring was sort of output based without counting quality. So for example, they'd count how many policies were made, but not whether these policies conform to our peer each uh, implementing rules. Second on the right, the lack of the roadmap, information roadmap, really hampered accountability because such a thing leads to self-regulation and weak joint accountability. So on paper, DOH is primarily accountable to the COC and Office of the President. In practice, the accountability of the NIT is self-regulation. Uh, so you can't review progress against the roadmap because there is no roadmap that the Congress or Office of the President can review. Uh, there was not really much ownership and buy-in from other agencies aside from DOH and Popcom and PhilHealth uh, because, as I mentioned, the NIT meetings were not really focused on that. They did not uh, sort of take advantage of other sectors being in the NIT. And so the focus of an NGA is really left up to individual agencies, which make, make them prioritize certain key results area or certain RPRs elements that they can understand. Okay, so in this, here I synthesize everything in sort of a timeline, uh, looking at the history in light of what happened to the RPRH law. So in terms of progress, this assessment saw that uh, the RPRH was really just in launch phase in 2019. So uh, we found that RPRH programs, coordinating bodies, and awareness for RPRH within NGAs were still being set up or incomplete. And part of it was the effect of legal battles for the Supreme Court from 2013 to 2017. So starting from the left of the figure in 2012, where the law was passed, it was more or less stalled from 2013 to 2014, then partially from 2016 to 2017. Because after a month, uh, where the law was passed, the Supreme Court issued a status quo anti-order that essentially said it, uh, that, that would review if the law was unconstitutional. The order was lifted in 2014, but then again in 2015, there was a temporary restraining order for the DOH procurement of family planning commodities. So though the other elements of the RPRH law were not under the TRO, a lot of the efforts of the DOH and POPCOM were focused on lifting the TRO and the FDA are certifying 51 in contraceptives. So the, the Supreme Court issues only really ended in November 2017. So it's against this difficult backdrop that the RPRH implementation was launched uh, during the time of this assessment. Uh, hence, it's understandable that uh, this phase for them was really about setting up the programs, coordinating bodies, increasing awareness and advocacy. Uh, but overall, still the strategic approach was really siloed, programmatic, biomedical, focusing too much on commodities, 
Uh, but during the time of this interview, they themselves, the NIT members, really aware of this problem and uh, we're trying to move forward uh, to address them. So overall, our recommendations for the future was really more about setting up systems for more collaborative governance among multiple sectors and how to start integrating RPRH into national governance and LGU operations. Okay. Uh, this is just a quick summary of our immediate recommendations, immediate, medium, and long term. Uh, the number one thing we recommend that is that they should really use a holistic framework that goes beyond viewing RPRH as a health sector issue to one that's about population development and right. For example, this means tackling more structural elements of the RPRH as a, such as empowering women and children, uh, education, and poverty reduction. So we really wanted them to switch to a system approach in integrating RPRH and not just a family planning centric approach. So our three main points of recommendations were one, immediately maximize strategic oversight in NIT and its members. So each member must understand that RPRH landscape and their role in it, not just like um, attending NIT meetings. And this really means harmonizing the understanding of members to so a roadmap strategic plan uh, that includes but not limited to a comprehensive package of RPRH services, uh, innovations for existing activities, accelerating work on neglected elements, and agency strategies to institutionalize these three. Okay. Medium to long term, it's about mobilizing the national government agencies to uh, finish and actually do their plans. And long term, it's to hold them accountable against the roadmap. Okay. So I think that's everything. Thank you very much. Uh, hand it over back to Ma'am Sheila. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jana, for enlightening us on the national level governance of the RPRH law. So essentially, Jana has uh, um, underscored based on their studies findings a number of um, implementation issues such as the siloed implementation of the law, um, also the lack of dedicated focal units for RPR RPRH in those agencies, uh, in the um, agencies she mentioned, the uh, substantial focus of the budget and family uh, family planning and maternal and child health services and less on other RPRH services and uh, also the lack of a unified monitoring and evaluation system. We can revisit all those issues um, during the open forum and we will hear uh, more from um, um, from Jana and, and her co-author in the Q&A. Okay, so at this point from national level governance, let us look this time at how the law is implemented on the ground. And uh, Dr. Michael Abrigo will tell us how our local government uh, units uh, fared in delivering the full range of RPRH services to their communities as mandated by the law. Dr. Abrigo is a senior research fellow at PIDS where he works on population health and nutrition policy issues. And prior to his return to the Philippines, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the East West Center in Honolulu, where he obtained he, his uh, PhD in economics from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Mike, the virtual floor is now yours. Uh, thank you so much, Sheila. And magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Uh, thank you for uh, going to this uh, webinar. Uh, while waiting for my slides to show up, uh, Mike could show it up. Uh, I just want to share that uh, this study is part of a series of studies on the evaluating our, the RPRH law. Uh, it started out 2018, but the actual study uh, was conducted uh, in 2020. Uh, there's a lot of drama uh, in, in doing this study because uh, while we were uh, doing field work, doing our KIs, FGDs, uh, the first leg of our uh, field work, uh, actually, do nag start yung nag open yung. Uh, pandemic in the Philippines, and we had to pack up and uh, and reassess um, um, our activities. So there are a number of components in this study. So there's the macro component, which was presented earlier, and then uh, at the more um, micro level, we have this local service delivery component, and then uh, uh, something that cuts across uh, macro, meso, and the micro is the education component that will be presented uh, later. And then there's another component, which is a legal review of the RPRH law, which is uh, being conducted by uh, uh, MN Professor uh, uh, Beth Pangalangan from the UP uh, School, uh, College of Law and the UP Law Center. Uh, she is not here, but hopefully in the future it will also be presented. Uh, the end view is that we would have, if there would be um, uh, 
an impact evaluation of these of the RPRH law, we would have these proxy evaluations looking at this many different aspects of the law. And uh, this one, specifically this study that I'm presenting, is on local service delivery, which I worked with uh, Jer uh, Jerome Patrick Cruz, who is at uh, University of Illinois, I think, right now, and uh, our very own Sandra Sitam. Next slide, please. So uh, I only have 20 minutes. Uh, there are 48 slides in this presentation. I would skim through most of it. In the last five minutes, uh, I would go through uh, our recommendations, which I think is the more important part of this study. But this is the summary of the things that I want you to remember from this study. One is that um, LGUs play a very important role, very important roles, Maramisha, in the delivery of RPH, RH services. And, and there has been some progress along some dimensions of RPRH, and we need to, to celebrate those progress at community level. But then uh, much is to be desired uh, in this progress. And then finally, uh, based on the results of our uh, uh, evaluation, there's a need to focus on building required support to ensure that there's the delivery of minimum quality of service at the local level. So remember these three just in case maputol ako somewhere. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a review uh, of our parish law. Malamang sa malamang alam nito if you're attending this webinar. So it was enacted in July 2012, but uh, 1970s pa lang, we've been trying to have a, a law something like this. Uh, but then since uh, July 2012, it has faced many legal obstacles. Uh, the, the RPRH law is a landmark law that guarantees universal access to medically safe, non-abortifacient, effective uh, reproductive health services and relevant information and education is given free to underprivileged sectors. Uh, next slide. And this is just a timeline of, of the RPRH law since 2012. This was also presented um, earlier. But uh, the takeaway from this uh, timeline is that we did our evaluation in 2020. Uh, and the, the law wasn't actually implemented fully until 2017. So when we were doing the evaluations, wala pang tatlong taon yung law. And I, I think uh, it's still a young law and there's still much room uh, for it to grow. Uh, especially the implementation side. Next slide. So uh, from the law, uh, we know that local governments play important roles in the delivery of R RPRH services. And kanina pinakita yung governance at the national level. But if you go to the next slide, please, uh, nakasulat dun sa RPRH law and its implementing rules and regulations. Ano ba yung mga responsibilities ng LGUs in implementing this law? So, at mga functional areas that we've identified. So, for service provision, it says that LGU should ensure the provision of a full range of RPRH healthcare services among local public health facilities, including all modern family planning methods. Sa HRH, it needs to maintain a sufficient number of skilled health staff in, in public health facilities. In health facilities, it needs to uh, LGUs need to establish and upgrade local public health facilities for del delivering RPRH services, especially yung mga emergency obstetrics and newborn care, uh, supplies, products, and equipment. Uh, LGUs are tasked to ensure that local public health facilities have supplies and equipment for delivering these RPRH services uh, through the wage provision and possibly through LGUs uh, own procurement program. Meron pang susunod? Next slide, please. So service delivery network, uh, the law also tasks LGUs to map and build the local service delivery networks, including both public and private health facilities uh, with proper referral mechanisms for RPRH services. For health promotion, it, uh, it needs to develop and implement RPRH health uh, promotion, education, and communication plans, although we didn't tackle this uh, as the next uh, presentation. Yun. It, also, it was also tasked to do maternal, fetal, infant death reviews. And for funding, uh, it was uh, mandated to allocate sufficient local funds for RPRH implementation. Uh, next slide. So, so maraming, maraming hinihingi yung batas sa ating mga LGU. And part and pinakamalaki doon is that they need to provide uh, comprehensive RH care. And part of this RH care is family planning, maternal and child health, adolescent sexual and reproductive health. So next slide, you would see uh, violence against women and child and, and their children, uh, reproductive tract infections, disorders, and HIV. So, so yung buong, halos yung buong tract ng RPRH law, um, nakatask doon sa LGU na implement Next slide. So this study, uh, 
looks at, uh, at that implementation at the local level. We, uh, the study aims to assess the service delivery mechanisms of RPH-related programs at the local government level and to identify enabling factors, barriers, and bottlenecks that affect the timely and efficient delivery of reproductive health services and commodities at the front line. So we have three uh, specific questions. What have we accomplished so far? So we want to look at outcomes and then are mandated services provided? So you mga kailangan provide ng LGUs, yung mga outputs nila dapat for the RPRH law. Uh, are they being provided? And then finally, are the mandated support built? Kasi in order to provide those services, kailangan mo ng inputs uh, to, 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 do, to, to, to do those services. So meron ba nun? So we want to look at these uh, aspects of the implementation. Uh, by LGUs. And guiding us is this RPH logical framework by the DOH and POPCO, which just which just shows you input process, input and processes, outputs, outcomes. Naka focus kami sa inputs processes and outputs. Yung outcomes so we just breeze through it. Uh, kasi yung focus talaga ng aming uh, aming evaluations just hanggang sa outputs sana. Pero sinamin namin yung outcomes just to provide a flavor of nasa na ba tayo ngayon. Next slide please. So uh, we did a uh, mixed method design. So we have an LGU online survey. Uh, we were hoping to have a full census of all local governments in the Philippines. Unfortunately, uh, when we were doing this online survey, uh, pandemic, we didn't know uh, what's happening, uh, what's to what to expect, and, and people at the local level were actually very busy. Konti lang yung aming na hamig na sumagot. So for provinces out of 81, we've got 23. For municipalities, 25 of about 1,500. Uh, cities, 16, uh, 16 out of about 150. And major comprehensive view of our online survey. So on average, about 56% of the questions were answered. So hindi siya masyadong complete. But, but then uh, we were not uh, aiming for um, representativeness, what we want is some flavor. We want it to be comprehensive and provide some flavor. Uh, ano ba yung nangyayari? We also did FGDs, KAIs with program managers, frontline workers. Uh, we were supposed to do it uh, in Luzon, besides Mindanao and NCR, but unfortunately, we were only able to do uh, the face-to-face -face one in Leyte, tapos nagka-COVID na nga. And then, uh, hindi kami nakakuha ng uh, Northern Luzon that was supposed to be Baguio, but nahihirapan kami, ano, so we ended up with this. And then we did thematic analysis of the quarterly uh, regional implementing uh, team minutes of meetings. We also did analysis of secondary data, so from the Bureau of Local Government Finance data and DHS. Uh, we were hoping to get uh, data na that is representative of the whole Philippines rather than yung, hindi masyadong, yung, so yung quality ng data is important to us. And the study plan instruments were reviewed by St. Cabrini Medical Center at the Asian Eye Institute. Um, next slide, please. So what have we accomplished so far? In the next slide, you would see na meron naman tayong na-accomplish. Uh, so for instance, uh, there are three timelines here. So yung baseline update, uh, which is the latest available year, and then the target. Ano ba yung target? That's provided in one of the documents uh, by government. So in this case, NOH would be the uh, national objectives for health for 2011-2016. So for MMR, uh, we and wage is targeting 50 per 100,000 population as a 86 tayo uh, between 2013 and 2016. So hindi tayo umabot pa, medyo mataas pa ng konte. Uh, in the mortality ratio, we were targeting 10 per thousand live births. Uh, medyo hindi pa rin tayo umabot. Uh, proportion of pregnant women with at least four antenatal care visits. So so meron tayo yung mga ganon na hindi tayo medyo umabot sa ating mga targets. Uh, next slide, please. So, ito, uh, yung iba dito, uh, much of these uh, indicators are from the uh, MND framework, no RPRH uh, by DOH and Popcom. But may, some of these we've identified, uh, kami yun identified based on available data. So, this is for uh, human resource. Next slide, please. So this is for family planning. So the modern contraceptive surveillance rate among currently married women, and which is targeting 65% by 2016. In 2017, it's 40%. So uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, next slide. So ito, okay tayo dito. So adolescent birth rate, ang target is 50 per uh, thousand in 2018. 
uh, from 57 in reaches in 2013, bobatay to 47. So, okay tayo doon. Uh, percentage of adults who had sexual intercourse before uh, age 15, we are targeting less than 2%. So, from 2013, 2.2%. In 2017, 1.6%. So, check din tayo dyan. So, meron tayo mga successes, but then uh, there are some areas na kailangan pa nating uh, mag-improve pa. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So this is just a list of, uh, of the things. Uh, this is an open inv uh, invitation for you to check the paper where this presentation is based on so that uh, in details ma makita nyo then. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so the one that I presented earlier is at the national level. But when you look at uh, the regional level, there's disparity in the progress uh, in how things uh, uh, have been doing uh, in many of these outcomes. So for demand for family planning, you will see yung, yung exacts would be women with met family planning need between 2013 and 2017. So kung nasa right ka, ibig sabihin, uh, tumaas. Pag nasa left ka nung line, bumaba. Tapos yung y-axis natin, women with unmet family planning need. Uh, pag nasa taas ka, ibig sabihin, tumaas yung unmet family planning need nyo noong 2013, 2017. Uh, pag nasa baba ka, uh, so gusto mo uh, lumiit yung unmet family planning need to mas yung met family planning need. So dapat nandito tayo sa kung nasa yung ARMM, yung region 6, 5. So nandun tayo dapat. Yun ang gusto natin. But unfortunately, uh, for some of the regions, uh, nandun sila sa kabilang side. So and, and these uh, disparity across the regions, makikita mo uh, on different outcomes. So early childbearing and as I knowledge, uh, on your right, uh, next slide, please. Uh, delivery by skilled attendant and infant mortality rate, uh, violence against women, and help seeking behavior. So you, you see this disparity across the region. And and ang sinasabi ko lang dito is that uh, when you look at the national numbers, it looks like walang progress or there could be progress. But when you look at the regions, iba iba yung experiences ng ating mga uh, sa, sa mga localities. Next slide. So. So the next question is, these are the outcomes. So what next? Are the mandated services provided? Yung bang mga services na sinabi ng uh, RPRH law na ibigay ba ng ating mga LGUs? At marami silang hinihingi. So uh, ang sistema ko dito is that uh, I'd provide the role uh, that's, that's mandated by the law. And then ano ba yung nangyayari at the local level based on our data gathering? So service provision. So, sabi ng uh, RPRH law, the LGU needs to ensure the provision of full range of RPH healthcare services among local public health facilities, including all modern family planning methods. Well, uh, for the most part, based on our data gathering, these services are actually part of LGU services even before RPRH laws. And many of the, the people that we've talked to said that these that the RPRH law is just a formality of this implementation. So. Uh, the RPRH services are generally provided or referral to other facilities uh, are, are given if it's not provided uh, particularly by the LGU, like for mental health services. Uh, although, walang nagsabi doon na uh, they contact services from the private sector, which is allowed under the law. Uh, for the most part, immunization services provided once a week, although meron ding mga konti na araw-araw sila nagbibigay. Uh, yung pre-marriage orientation counseling, uh, this is required before the issuance of marriage license. Uh, it's been there uh, even before the RPRH law. Next slide, please. So while services are generally available, there appears to be material differences in the provision of these mandated services. So for instance, uh, we asked them, meron lista ano sa RPRH law, ano ba dapat yung binibigay no no mga LGUs, uh, it, it depends on whether you're a province, uh, you're a city, you're a municipality. So, tinanong namin sa kanila, meron ba kayong ganitong service? At ito yung mga usual na sinasabing uh, wala silang binibigay. So, uh, natural family planning supply, so yung charts, equal thermometers, standard these method beads, uh, wala silang supply niyan sa LGUs for, for many of the uh, LGUs that we've talked to. So, yung resupply in condo of condoms and other contraceptive pills, uh, uh, some LGUs uh, mentioned this, na wala silang ganyan. So, not all LGUs have assigned uh, poor to designated healthcare provider for um, RH services. So this is mandated by law, pero meron mga, mga, uh, mga LGUs na hindi nakakapagbigay ng ganyan servisyo. 
And while there have been steps to cater to special needs of PWD, some LGUs reported not being able to provide access to information and adopt procedures for PWD needs. So, ito yung tenor ng ng mga uh, aming mga observations uh, throughout this. Uh, next slide, please. So, in crisis situations, so sabi dun sa uh, RPRH law, the, the LGU should provide these R services in crisis situations. However, many reported that there's no changes in service delivery during crisis situations. In evacuation centers, uh, usually medical and psychosocial yung mga interventions and not necessarily family planning services as mandated by law. And actually, yung COVID-19 is a real-life test of the RPR service provision during a crisis. And many reported during that time that there were no changes in the service delivery uh, siguro ang medyo nagbago lang ay yung pre-marriage counseling uh, kasi ginawa nila is they condensed this from usual na 4 hours into 30 minutes. Although sinabi naman nila na medyo kumunti naman yung kumuha ng pre-marriage counseling. Next slide please. Uh, so medyo marami tong listahan na to and I would skip through most of it but I invite you to to read the paper kasi yung uh, details of this uh, are um, are in the paper, so service delivery network, they're supposed to map and build this, but unfortunately, uh, sabi nila, most of them actually said that they already mapped these healthcare facilities, but some LGUs do not include private sector in this uh, service delivery network. Next slide. Uh, health promotion, uh, the, the next presentation would uh, present this more. Uh, but I think the, the, the important part of this is that some LGUs actually were able to leverage on social media through Facebook and traditional media, even yung regular, uh, regular radio plug, uh, plugs, radio plugs uh, as platforms to disseminate it on mga uh, RPRH na services nila. Next slide, please. So, maternal and fetal infant death reviews. Uh, sinasabi nila yung mga nakausap namin, they have maternal death reviews. Uh, usually monthly, but others less frequently, uh, yung iba quarterly. At doon sa mga nakausap namin, uh, walang nagsabi na they had uh, fetal or infant death reviews. Um, uh, but maybe, karamihan sa kanilang sinasabi sinasabi na wala naman daw namatay na bata sa kanila, kaya walang uh, ganitong uh, review. Next slide, please. So, are the mandated support built? So, dapat meron servisyo, uh, pero paano ka magbigay ng servisyo kung wala yung support para magawa mo yung servisyo. So, next slide please. So, we look at different facets. So, we look at healthy human resources. Ang sabi doon, the, the LGUs need to maintain a sufficient number of uh, skilled health staff. But, uh, based on our analysis, uh, well, maraming, maraming lugar sa Pilipinas, mga LGUs, that do not meet the 23 uh, doctors, nurses, midwives for 10,000 population. Uh, that is recommended by the WHO to meet the 80% delivery of, uh, of by skilled birth attendants. Uh, next slide, please. And more so, if you look ju at just the government uh, health workers. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, the, the previous slide, the one, uh, yung right neto is without the DOH augmentation. And if you see, kung nyo dun sa 23, uh, masyadong malayo talaga yung uh, HRH density natin at the uh, local levels. And even with the DOH uh, augmentation, hindi tayo aabot sa 23, may hinihingi ng WHO sana. So we need uh, to do more to be able to raise, to, to, to raise that uh, density. Next slide, please. So, next slide pa. Uh, isa pa magandang kwento dito. Uh, the law requires na meron kang RH officer for the day, but many of the LGUs that you talk to, wala silang ganun. Uh, they've identified many issues, so fast turnover, need for training, heavy workload. Uh, there were some instances na sinasabi nung uh, nakausap namin na sa sobrang dami nung mga reports na kailangan nilang gawin. Sometimes they stop the service so that they can do the, ano, the recording. Uh, they also reported difficulty in hiring and volatile uh, okay, so if you go to, uh, Michael, can you go to uh, conclusion and the recommendation, please? Okay, so um, I skipped through most of it, but then that, that is the tenor of the results that we found that uh, 
Meron mga serbisyo na gusto na kailangang ibigay pero hindi ba ibigay kasi kulang tayo ng resources. And, and, and that, that's the story whether you look at the human resource, financing, supplies. So in, in conclusion, uh, we saw that there has been some progress along some dimensions of the RPRH law. Uh, so while services are generally available, there appears to be differences in the provision of these mandated services. Um, there were many new initiatives by LGU that need to be documented and assessed. We, we, we saw that. And we saw also some growth in the maintained support of RPR ratio, but then uh, more may, may be needed. Next slide, please. So uh, there are three key recommendations, uh, no, 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 three blocks of recommendations uh, that I want to focus on. One is on building needed support for RPRH. Uh, for RPRH. One is that uh, there is a need to, be, to better forecast young demand. Uh, yung, that there would be an effective supply chain management or because we know that effective supply chain management is crucial in ensuring non -st uh, no stock outs or overstocks because we've documented na there were instances na meron mga, re mga LGUs na walang stock pero mal meron malapit sa kanila na sobra-sobra naman stock. So we need to forecast that demand uh, better. Uh, we also think that yung reliance natin on the which HHR augmentation may not be sustainable. So we need, yung local governments need to attract, develop, and maintain local health talents that would be funded by LGU so that they would be able to, to, to uh, make it more sustainable. Uh, finally, yung last slide. So delivery of services, uh, the LGUs need to ensure the minimum quality of service per law. Uh, and we welcome innovations, but we need to identify on, and focus on, on what works. And finally, on monitoring progress, uh, there's a need to streamline indicators uh, given the capacity to deliver. And then we need to focus what can be delivered effectively by different stakeholders. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm very sorry for going over time. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, that was an insightful discussion of your findings at the local level. So um, from Mike's presentation, we have seen that uh, there's some progress, there are some successes, but um, in many of the key result areas, the targets have not been met. And also, Mike discussed some glaring gaps in the provision of the mandated services. He and his co-authors so marked differences across the LGUs in, in the sense that, uh, for example, some products and services are unavailable and dedicated staff for um, reproductive health services are either lacking or limited. He also um, uh, briefly uh, touched on uh, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the delivery of RPRH services. So uh, we'll hear more from Mike uh, during the open forum and uh, he can uh, elaborate uh, or dis and, and discuss some of the uh, slides no, or the, some of the findings that he was not able to um, cover uh, in his presentation due to the limited time, okay? So at this point, let us now go to the last presentation, which will be on the education and communication component of the RPRH law and how this mandate was carried out by the implementing agency. So this topic will be covered by Dr. Uh, Mary Pauline Sapking, who's a consultant of, of PIDS. Dr. Sapking has been a nurse educator in various schools of nursing since uh, 2005 and the founder and chief executive officer of Pathways Center for Lifelong Learning Incorporated. Her research interests include education, health, and gender and development. She obtained her bachelor's and master's degrees in nursing from St. Mary's University and her doctorate in educational administration from the Pamantasa ng Lunso ng Maynila. Dr. Saki, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Ms. Sheila. Um, I'm just going to share my slide now. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for coming to this webinar. And I would also like to thank the PIDS for having my co-author and myself today for this presentation. Um, of course, for us to share with you the process evaluation of the RPRH law, RPRH communication and education. I would also like to thank our fellow presenters for providing us as part of their presentation with substantial introduction of the RPRH law, its timeline, its history, as well as the circumstances surrounding the conduct of our studies. So for our part of the studies, or for our, uh, for, for our study, the objective 
uh, given the mandate, let me just minimize this. Okay, there you go. This paper focuses on the implementation of the reproductive health education mandate of the RPRH, specifically on the output level performance of the implementing agencies and personnel and the en enabling factors and barriers that affect the implementation of the program. So the implementa uh, implementing agencies for RPRH communication and education are as follows. So under communication, we have DOH, PIA, and DLGUs. So DOH, the PIA, and the LGUs um, have the collaborative responsibility of initiating and sustaining a heightened multimedia campaign. And DOH also has the responsibility to develop a health promotion and communication plan, as well as guidelines for monitoring and evaluation and review and release of guidelines on awarding and recognition. So for education, on the other hand, we have DepEd, SHED, TESDA, and under DepEd, we have the schools. DepEd, SHED, and the TESDA are responsible for the integration of the RPRH information into formal, non-formal, and indigenous learning. Then DepEd, um, curriculum development, training for educators, inclusion of RPRH education in teacher, child, parents, activities, and sustainability. So the schools under uh, DepEd are responsible for the provision of supportive environment. Now, what did we do? Um, we did document review, key informant interviews, focus group discussions. We used semi-structured interview guides and utilized content and thematic analysis. analysis. So for our findings, um, the review of relevant documents, interviews, and FGDs show that the key agencies in the implementation of the RPRH education and communication manifest compliance with some of the provisions of the RPRH laws IRR. As to the implementation of its mandate to assist the DOH in implementing RPRH public awareness, information dissemination, and communication. The PIA showed that while it has no policies or programs specific to the RPRH, it has been responding to the RPRH-related communication needs of the LGUs and concerned agencies upon the latter's initiative by providing technical and non-technical assistance as well as non-monetary funding provisions. Moreover, it has been complying with some of its elements through its implementation of the Gender and Development program. Now, in terms of RPRH education, the DepEd's major accomplishment is the development and issuance of the policies and guidelines on the implementation of the CSE in 2018. In terms of implementation of the actual curriculum required by the IRR nonetheless, at the time of the interviews three years later, there is an apparent delay in the implementation of the RPRH education provisions, considering the timeline of events presented, and there seems to have a serious need for a more detailed presentation of what needs to be done at the level of instruction, considering the information that the said guidelines have not reached the teachers, and that is uh, that there is an apparent lack of qualified manpower, facilities, trainings, instructional materials, coordination, and monitoring system. Now, um, our policy recommendations um, for RPRH, RPRH communication, specifically on the lack of policies programs specific to RPRH at the DOH HPCS, based on the interview, while there is a national policy on health promotion, there are no existing policies or programs specific to the provisions of the IRR, such as initiation and sustenance of a heightened nationwide multimedia campaign, development of a health promotion and communication plan, continuation of the implementation of existing approved health promotion and communication strategies, technical and other necessary assistance to the LGUs, review of the health promotion and communication within 60 days from the implement implementation of the IRR. And in order to better implement such provisions, it is recommended that a focal point person for the RPRH program be assigned at the DOH HPCS. On the lack of policies and programs specific to RPRH public awareness and communication at the PIA. As expressed during the interview, the PIA provides technical assistance to LGUs relevant to RPRH as it does for any other government program. 
However, the agency has no set objectives specific for RPRH. As such, and as suggested by the PIA representative, it is recommended that targets specific to RPRH be set at the PIA for better implementation of the RPRH law. Now, our policy recommendations for RPRH education specifically on the need for a written curriculum for CSE integration across all subject areas. In DO31, it is specified that only in certain subject areas is RPRH information mandatorily integrated, which runs counter to the provision of the IRR that such information must be integrated in all subject areas. To address this, among other needs relevant to the development of the curriculum required by the IRR, it is recommended that supplemental guidelines on the implementation of RPRH education or CSE with details on ext extent of integration across all subject areas be issued. On the need for teacher guides on age and development appropriate RPRH topics. So according to the interviews, RPRH topics can be easily identified as age and development appropriate if they are already incorporated in curriculum guides provided to the teachers. This will also ensure that such topics have been carefully chosen and arranged based on the needs of the learners and their developmental stages. It is recommended then that curriculum guides and other instructional materials for age and development appropriate CSE be issued. On the lack of teacher trainings, while RPRH education trainings are said to be well, then currently being conducted, the interviews revealed that the, the, the need for more inclusive and accessible trainings for teachers in order for them to better equip themselves for effective instruction. Such provision of inclusive and accessible teacher training specific to CSE is highly recommended. On the need to strengthen uh, psychosocial services specific to RPRH. During the interviews, it was expressed that teachers are assigned to deliver some of the tasks expected of licensed guidance counselors and school nurses due to lack of personnel in their respective schools. As such, ensuring the hiring of licensed guidance counselors and school nurses is recommended to more properly address the RPRH-related psychosocial needs of the students. Equally important, of course, is the provision of physical facilities of, uh, for such services, considering the lack of such. It is also recommended that dissemination mechanisms for RPRH information available in school facilities be developed. And on the need to strengthen overall implementation of the RPRH law in education. While most of the provisions of the law have been complied with given the continuous efforts of the implementing agencies, there is still a need for strengthened programs to realize the goals of the RPRH law, especially in education. In order to enhance the motivating and enabling factors in the implementation of the CSE, creation of awards and recognition guidelines for compliant schools, allotment of RPRH specific budget, and creation of RPRH implementation committee in schools are recommended. So that's all for our study. Thank you very much for listening and uh, good day. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Um... Uh, sucking for uh, um, for the presentation. So uh, Pauline has mentioned that while there was compliance with some of the provisions of the law, while well, gaps are, are still apparent in the performance of some key agencies as, as the required actions stated in the law's IRR have not been met, such as, for example, uh, let me cite uh, some of our findings. Uh, let's say in the case of the PIA, having a sustained nationwide multimedia campaign or PRH that was lacking. And in the case of Let's say the depth ed, uh, the lack of accessible and inclusive training for teachers uh, to equip them on the knowledge and skills needed to teach about, um, let's say, reproductive health care. Okay, thank you to all our three presenters. So at this point, let us listen to the reactions of our discussion. So we invited two of the main implementing agencies of the RPRH law to react on the study's findings and recommendations and provide their insights as well. So we will hear first from the Department of Health, as uh, Jana mentioned um, earlier in the, in the webinar, uh, uh, PIDS submitted uh, the reports to the DOH and uh, there have been some actions already uh, implemented or uh, carried out by the DOH in response to the findings. So 
we have um, Dr. Mara Jean Almozora Miliar, Supervising Health Program Officer under the under the Disease Prevention and Control Bureau's Adolescent and Maternal Health Division, uh, formerly known as the Family Health Division. And Dr. Miliar has a bachelor's degree in pharmacy from the University of Santo Tomas and um, obtained her Doctor of Medicine degree from the same university. So to speak after Dr. Miliar is Mr. Ken Raymond Borling, a registered nurse and currently supervising health program officer in the same division and bureau of the DOH. Ken is an alumnus of the University of San Carlos in Cebu City, where he obtained his degree in nursing. He also has a master's degree in public health from the Institute of Community and Family Health. Mara and Ken, you now have the virtual floor. Thank you, Ms. Mina. Good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Dr. Maria Amatara Maria. So I am from the Family Health Division. So it is formerly known as the Women and Child Health Division of the DOHDPCB. So since the reorganization of our bureau, we are now uh, we're also referred to as the Adolescent and Maternal Health uh, Division. So thank you for having us here. It's an honor to be one of the discussions and be able to actually hear and comment on the presentation of our authors of this discussion of papers on the assessment of the implementation of the RA10354 or the RPRH law. And as we know, the RPRH law is uh, after several decades of controversy and public debate in 2012, it was enacted and guarantees the and, and enable measures for sexual and reproductive rights of men, women, young people, and families. So this is through the comprehensive accessible reproductive health services. Um, reproductive health is a, of course, we know that it's a state of complete physical, mental, social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And we know that it's a definition of health. And reproductive health, it involves all matters relating to the reproductive system and to its functions and processes. So reproductive health implies that people have the capability to reproduce and freedom to decide if and when how often to do so. And which makes access to modern family planning methods very fundamental to the realization that the rights and the well-being of men and women and also this will help avoid the adverse health and socioeconomic consequences of unintended pregnancy. But of course, you know, the family planning or in uh, reproductive health in broad strokes, it's a provision that is supposed to be um, designed to help individuals achieve their reproductive goals, which should not have a singular focus of uh, preventing unintended pregnancy. So as this is not consistent with all, all of the patient's preferences, and rather we should be focusing on assisting them, the women and men to reach their desired reproductive outcomes uh, by supporting them to make an informed decision. So in short, we would like to help them, people to make and carry out uh, these decisions about their fertility, contraceptive use, and all other elements of their reproductive health. So this is also aligned in our uh, Philippines uh, pre commit 2030 commitment, wherein by the end of 2030, all Filipinos uh, should enjoy a healthy and productive life and are empowered to make informed decisions in family planning and their reproductive health and rights. However, uh, service delivery and social constraints are uh, still persist. So in the seventh year of the implement implementation of the RPRH, the DOH commissioned the Philippine Institute of Development Studies, or PEDS, to conduct an evaluation of its implementation from the year of its commencement through 2019. So this must be a truly challenging study to collect all the pertinent qualitative data and teach them all together and, and be able to obtain a good analysis. It's uh, very timely and relevant as it would really help us better understand the dynamics of our, uh, our reproductive health in our society and what are the next steps we need to uh, take in order to adapt to these uh, macro trends and in alignment with the UHC and the reaffirmed Mandana's ruling. So the comprehensive report uh, highlighted key areas, the gaps and operational issues therein that uh, required um, critical actions from various stakeholders. 
So this assessment also presented how the RPRH was uh, being governed and implemented across various public and private agencies. So the PH focused on three areas. I've noticed that first is the governance and local service delivery, and lastly is the communication, education, and advocacy. So they raised several recommendations and uh, uh, to address operational issues and gaps. So while critical, uh, our, our each indicators have improved, uh, such as the unmet need for family planning, other critical indicators um, have been left behind. So the country has yet to reach the minimal millennium development goals or the MDG of the reducing um, maternal mortality, uh, lowering the HIV AIDS incidence, improving health and nutrition as well. Uh, one of the notable findings of these was the fragmented governance activities and they saw that it was from a lack of integrated plans and coordination mechanisms in the nine governance components to bridge the NGA's efforts across sectors. So most of the programs done by each stakeholder overlapped and they saw that uh, there are programs that were neglected or lack support. So medical program that were insufficient, of course, and remarkably improving the RH outcomes. Hence, there's a need for a review of the existing strategy to create new policies that are unidirectional. So where all partners can collaborate to establish a solid framework where each component of governance will be equally involved. So from the peace recommendation to strengthen the interagency collaboration for uh, the implementation of RPRH and also in consideration of the UAC efforts amid the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, this led the DH to the realization for the need to develop a multi-sectoral strategic plan, which aims to strengthen our interagency collaboration for its implementation and also the monitoring and evaluation framework this will to ensure the sustainability so the concept under uh was started in august last year presented to stakeholders and to our development partner which they agreed to provide technical assistance to us for the onboarding of the project team and uh, to spearhead the development of the strategic plan which underwent a series of consultations so we took note that in order uh, to make an effective change, we must first understand the current reality of the implementation of the RPRH law and its components. We need to identify the challenges, the gaps in its structures, the processes, and the ideas to remind us of its purpose. So this is in, uh, this in turn will help us react, uh, restructure, redesign, and reframe ourselves to affect our responses and build new structures develop new processes and inculcate new ideas and this will direct us to our uh, purpose and preferred rprh reality so the development of this plan or multi-sectoral strategic plan is so far is divided into four phases so the phase one is understanding the current uh, reality so here we would like to review and understand the current policies activities uh, awareness of our stakeholders on the RPRH law and its implementation. So we also create a core team who will be our champions of the RPRH law. So in the phase two, the, is the creating the team through capacity development, stakeholder engagement, and new institutional arrangement. And lastly, is the phase three and four, which is the creation of the national RPRH strategy framework that will manifest our shared vision. So this will be in the form of roadmaps and MNN frameworks. So currently we are in phase one of our process and we're done with the KIIs with our stakeholders and we're now finalizing the FGD. So phase two will hope uh, to begin um, uh, this June, will be composed of series of meetings and capacity development for our RPRH core teams. So one of the activities that uh, it's very important in this is the identification of the core team. 
uh, that will uh, lead to the development and to streamline the needed resources and expert inputs on the key elements of the RPRH. So uh, the target release date is will be in December 2022, hopefully, and then we envision this as a means to achieve um, universal access to RPRH services and ultimately improve health outcomes in sync with our goals of UHC. Um, additionally, uh, it was mentioned that we had a reorganization and BPCV has solidified its commitment to shift from the programmatic uh, disease intervention towards to enabling integrated service delivery with emphasis on strengthening primary care. So we already um, towards this, the BPCV developed the, its 6S framework, which is the standard strategy supportive supervision and the stewardship and synergy. So we're from the supportive supervision. So which clarifies the viewer's contribution to UHC strategy map. So this is the end of my discussion. I would like to congratulate Paige for writing this very comprehensive and stimulating paper. It's indeed a valuable paper for all the stakeholders and for RPRH law to be able to grasp the situation and make necessary changes. So thank you very much. Yeah, I think in the next, so I see, uh, I think Dr. Mara discussed about the actions taken by the Department of the, in terms of governance. So I'll be focused, uh, since we are time constrained, I'll be focusing on the local service delivery component of the studies. So um, I'll be providing no updates, um, just to be quick with the um, discuss, uh, with the reaction. I'll be providing updates in terms of the recommendations provided to us by our researchers. No, um, in terms of building needed support, um, particularly in addressing the concerns of stackouts and overstocking. No, as of today, um, actually, as we speak, to the DOH is currently conducting the electronic. Uh, uh, logistic Management Information System, or ELMIS, a uh, user acceptance testing here in Tagaytay, where I, where I am, I am attending. So we are doing this to address yung, uh, yung bottleneck stat in terms of stockouts. Um, the ELMIS, so that's how they call it, uh, will institutionalize a unified information system, end-to-end uh, -end ELMIS at all levels of the health systems uh, across the country. So um, currently we are uh, attended by uh, uh, DOH central and regional offices, uh, supply officers uh, currently, and also we have a uh, um, representative from Commission on Population and representative from LGU, select um, provincial health and uh, city health offices. So, and ito kami ngayon sa doing the training. And uh, in terms of uh, reliance, no, yung discussion ni Dr. Abrigo on reliance on DOH, HHR, augmentation, and the need to attract and maintain local talents and need to ensure the minimum uh, quality of service uh, uh, according to the law. Uh, considering the increase in the fiscal space among LGUs following the Bandanas ruling, uh, we hope to see increase in financing for RPRH programs and services, which is also this, um, the, 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 the findings of the study. No? Uh, once there is a uh, financial elasticity within uh, or among LGUs, there has been an increase in the um, expenditure in terms of uh, RPRH programming and services. So I also saw a guideline from DBM about waiving the PS cap or the personal uh, personal um, service limitation, uh, especially for LGUs to implement those. Um, um, functions devolved to them uh, with the Executive Order 138. So we hope to see increase in terms of uh, human resource. No, um, um, on the re uh, on the another recommendations on uh, um, bur unburdening uh, yung critical HHR reporting requirements and the need to streamline indicators and the need to focus on indicators that, that can be delivered more effectively by different stakeholders. So as discussed earlier by Dr. Mara, we are doing the RPRH multi-sectoral plan. So hopefully uh, once the plan uh, was is established, uh, we can identify the specific indicators that we want to monitor, not just, uh, for, not just for reporting purposes, but also for programming. And again, no, as of today, then the DOH is conducting the focus group discussion sessions with our uh, various regional implementation teams. Uh, this is a prep work for a big, uh, big uh, work for the development of the RPRH multi-sectoral strategic plan, which in will include the MNE 
framework. And then in terms of innovations naman daw, sinasabi ni Dr. Abrigo that we need to assess yung ating uh, uh, interventions being done, kung cost-effective ba siya. So the DOH, particularly po our office at the Family Health Division has been diligent in, in reviewing programs, plans, and activities of various government agencies uh, uh, pertaining to addressing teenage pregnancies, you know, with those, uh, especially with the issuance of the Executive Order 141. So we, uh, unfortunately, uh, there are popular interventions that have shown to be ineffective for adolescent sexual and reproductive health, but still continue being implemented by our um, um, uh, implementers, no? uh, particularly young youth centers, uh, peer education and high profile meetings. So these are interventions that according to studies are not cost effective or ineffective in terms of um, these are the things that we at uh, the Family Health Division always look at in terms of, uh, uh, for example, if there are um, if there are uh, proposed uh, policies or activities by uh, the government agencies, we always look at kung meron to mga teen centers. So we always uh, raise our um, reservation in doing these things. Um, um, I think that's pretty much it from my end. That's for the local service delivery uh, component of the study. Apologies if we cannot cover all the three studies, but well, we are quite uh, uh, short in time. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Miliar uh, and uh, Ken for uh, giving us updates on the um, actions that the DO that, that the department has uh, carried out so far in um, in response to the uh, findings and recommendations of the PIDS studies. Okay, you can elaborate your um, points and give us more details during the open forum. Okay, so our last discussion is from the Commission on Population. So we have Mr. Diogracias Hilvano, who is the Assistant Chief of the Planning, Monitoring, and Evaluation Division of PAPCOM. Um, Mr. Hilvano, Sir Dario, you, you may now proceed. Sir? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this very special discussion paper entitled An Assessment of National Level Governance of the Philippines Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Law Trends and Ways Forward. For the past years, PAPCOM has committed itself to the full implementation of the RPRH law. PAPCOM has been the vice chair and co secretary for the NIT and the RIT. As an organization that is geared towards the Philippine Population and Development Program, PAPCOM sees the potential of implementing and integrating the RPRH law as a whole in harnessing the demographic dividend and achieving socioeconomic development. The study research provides a comprehensive situation on the current context on the implementation of the RPRH law highlighting on the areas of performance, stewardship, and coordination and monitoring and evaluation. On performance, the studies provide a comprehensive representation on the accomplishments and efforts of individual agencies as well as cross agencies vis-a-vis -vis the RPRH elements. Firstly, PAPCOM acknowledges the performance and completion of mandates of different NGAs under the jurisdiction of their functions and continuing existing efforts in implementing the RPRH law despite the pandemic. PAPCOM continues to accomplish tasks that require interagency collaboration. Improvements were also done on PAPCOM DOH coordination and regional level distribution of DOH procured ethnic commodities through PAPCOM regional offices in line with the DOH NEDA PAPCOM JMC 2019-01. Aside from this, PAPCOM also procured ethnic commodities to augment the allocation of DOH. Likewise, the PAPCOM Supply Chain Management section is closely monitoring the distribution of ethnic commodities, particularly on the availability and stock outs in the different regions nationwide. Mechanisms on addressing unresolved challenges on governance, which includes ME and coordination, should be improved as stated in the study. The recommendations to review and revise the internal structures within the implementing bodies and streamlining the roles and composition of PWGs can help in overseeing the gaps, challenges, and issues in the implementation of the RPRH law. This also provides an opportunity to maximize the potential of NIT as a body, which will foster a sense of interconnectedness among RPRH implementers and accelerate progress and ensure a multi year perspective to RPRH implementation. On stewardship and coordination, the study thoroughly presented the initiatives of PAPCOM as a whole leader where PAPCOM maximized different platforms to lead and take initiatives in the implementation of RPRH law. 
Popcom recognizes that its role in the stewardship of the PRH can be improved. The study stated that Popcom's approach to population and development is epicentric and is in contrast with the transfer of Popcom to NEDAS and Artach AGC through the EO number 71 in 2018. While this may be claimed by looking at the percentage of budget allocation per program component, for the past years, Popcom sees FP not only as a health issue, but also a relevant variable in poverty alleviation, economic, and social development. This is evidenced by various interagency collaborative programs through the UN Development and Poverty Reduction Cabinet Cluster, or HDPRC, and Enhanced Partnership Against Hunger and P Poverty, or EPAP, where the RPFP program is currently en enrolled. Popcom will continue to direct its efforts towards the social and economic aspects of population development through the localization of the Philippine Population Development Program within the three program components, RPF, PHD, and PAPDEM, and the context of Bandana's Garcia ruling of 2018. PAPCOM believes that the division of labor between DOH and PAPCOM implementing the RPFP program are clear to the PD79 and the DOH NEDA PAPCOM JMC 2019-01. Due to the implications of fragmented implementation of the program since 2014, the recommendation on developing a unified strategy and operational plan for implementing agencies and CSOs are important to be considered. The creation of the RPRH multi-sector strategic plan has already started and is not yet to be accomplished by this year. Next for the discussion paper entitled, A Process Evaluation of Selected Programs of the Department of Health, RPRH Education and Communication. It is a well-organized study mentioning the roles and functions of each national government agencies private organizations and LGUs who are involved for the implementation of the RPRH law that include the accomplishments and fulfilling their roles as stated in the law. The roles per agency are well presented in the paper followed by the responding accomplishments of the roles specified in the law. On RPRH information, to complement the DOH on their role in prom on promotion and communication services, PAPCOM focus is promotional activities at the sub-national levels through its regional population offices. In partnership with LGUs, the conduct of RPFP classes is integrated under the Pantawid Pamilang Pilipino program. Aside from the four-piece strategy, other modes of sharing the RPFP information include non-four-piece, PMC house of giving information and referral clients with unmet need for modern FP to the nearest health facility. Kalalakihan tapat sa responsibilidad at obligations sa pamilya or katropa and information caravans. As a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, PAPCOM utilized the social media, FP, and YouTube to disseminate information and education to its intended beneficiaries. Our regional offices developed their own social media campaigns to reach out to couples individuals for its RPF classes, as well as to adolescents for its provision of ASRH information. On RPRH education, PAPCOM has developed modules that can be used for CSE. The Sexually Healthy and Personally Empowered Adolescents, or SHAPE A, learning package makes use of the CSE as an approach. As an approach, the CSE enables the adolescent learners to A, acquire accurate information on human sexuality and sexual and reproductive health or SRH in the context of human rights. B, explore and clarify values, adapt positive attitude to, towards SRH, and develop self-esteem and respect for human rights and gender equality. C, develop and practice life skills that allow them to nurture Respectful and productive relationship with family members, peers, friends, and romantic or intimate partners. PAPCOM also developed the learning package on parent education on adults in health and development or LPED, which underscored the important roles that parents play in shaping the future of the adolescents. PAPCOM provided trainings to teachers and parents about adults and reproductive health and, build, and building positive relationships with adults and using these modules. <clears throat> and for the next, for the next discussion paper, process evaluation of the responsible parenthood and productive health uh, local service delivery component. <clears throat> the study involved an extensive desk review, focus group discussion, informant interviews, at, and online survey of LGUs. The report presents the results of the process evaluation <clears throat> on the delivery of related services in communities by local government units under the Responsible Parent and Reproductive Health Law. The findings of the study showed significant disparities in various aspects of local service delivery, which may be linked to differences in the resources available to and provided by LGUs, such as in fiscal resources, local information systems, human resources, infrastructure and supply, 
and governance. While the report's recommendations are to improve the delivery of RPRA services, span measures to build support system for RPRH, improving service delivery and monitoring progress at the local government level. Parallel improvements in other are requisite inputs, particularly on local information systems, human resources, infrastructure and supply and governance are needed to ensure that the minimum service delivery requirements are met by all local governments. PACOM agreed that the timely and accurate forecast of RPRH service demand with effective supply chain management is crucial in reporting the stock outs and overstocks. Some LGUs reported that having trained personnel in various aspects of RPRH law implementation, which contributes to skill and capacity gap at the low level. One example is having HIV testing kits provided to an LGU that cannot be used because of the unavailability of training personnel. Also, the many community level RPRH services rely on volunteers, which happens to appear to have unequal levels of compensation, compensation among the different classes of volunteers, even within LGUs. NIT may consider the suggestion for LGUs to hire additional personnel to unburden critical health human resource or HHR from reportorial duties in order to allow HHRs to focus on providing frontline services. HHR may need to be unburdened from some reportorial responsibilities to monitor progress for RPR in service deliveries that is to ensure that a minimum quality of service as per law is provided across all local governments. On the absence of standard format used for most indicators, which often makes longitudinal comparison difficult, as mentioned in the study. This is also an observation of PAPCOM. Thus, NIT conducted a workshop to streamline the long list of indicators that are very challenging. The NIT conducted a workshop in February 2020 and streamlined the RPR ish indicators to focus on key measures that capture the capacity of local government units to provide services and extend a breach of their services. Consideration of the indicators availability and usefulness. Indicators are also classified in terms of sources, whether this is available at the national or at the local level. To date, the NIT Secretariat is working to address the issue of the reporting form <clears throat> Well, agreed to use the existing reporting while waiting for the final and approved RIT standard reporting format. COVID-19 pandemic contributed to the delay on decision-making of some agreements and approval of actions on the streamlined indicators. Also, local government units are also tasked to monitor the outcome and impact indicators for the whole country. That is, community and share LGUs do not submit reports and there are several cases expressing the need to harmonize and validate the contradictory data provided in such reports. Also, geographical isolation and technological barriers were also mentioned to contribute to the delay and submission of monetary reports that resulted in the dominant effect of later submission of the report at the national level. The NIT may consider the recommendation of the study in terms of collecting the regular representative sample survey to ensure that the data are both accurate and representative of the Philippine population. Uh, three key takeaways or highlights. Number one, using the nine components of governance, the assessment of national level governance of the RPRH law showed the inadequacies of the roles played by NGAs in the implementation of the law over the past eight years. There is a need to consider the recommendations from the discussion paper in order to develop appropriate interventions that will address the issues articulated in the paper. Number two, although the paper manifested the compliance of key agencies in the implementation of the RPR education and communication with some of the provisions of the law, NGAs have to synchronize their efforts and collaborate on the formulation of policies and development of programs for the provision of RPR Asian information and education. DOH, PAPCOM, PI, and other agencies have to leverage each other's strengths and advantages to bring their advocacies and campaigns down to the grassroots level. On the other hand, DepEd, given its scarce resources, has to forge partnership with other agencies such as DOH, PAPCOM, NYC, CWS, and other agencies on RPR education to obtain additional assistance, whether financial or infrastructure, in the implementation of the CSE guidelines. Number three, the local service delivery component of the RPR law will be a daunting challenge for NGAs amidst the implementation of the Supreme Court ruling on the Madanas Garcia petition. Among those affected will be the family planning services, which will be devolved to the LGUs. As such, some functions being handled by DOH and PAPCOM will be given to the LGUs, 
we should put further burden to the already deficient capacities to implement the law. The, Mandanda, the Mandanas Garcia ruling will magnify the role played by the LGUs in the implementation of the RPRH law. That's all. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deo Hilvano of Popcorn, for sharing uh, with us uh, your reactions and insights on the study's findings and recommendations. So, friends, um, at this point, we have heard the presentations, we have heard the um, the um the comments so at this point we would like to hear from you so we have come to the next part of our webinar which is the open forum but before that let us have a short break um a health break but at the same time those who would like to uh, participate uh in our next activity may do so okay so let's have a short break by uh, running a poll and this poll is open to our webex participants and viewers on Facebook. So here is our question. Okay. So among the implementation issues reported in the presentations, which do you think is the most serious and in need of immediate attention? Is it A, fragmented intra-agency and intra-agency coordination? B, lack of focal units in NGAs for RPRH implementation? C, in an insufficient number of health staff for RPRH in public facilities. D, insufficient local funds for RPRH implementation. Or E, inadequate communication and education. Okay, so uh, this, uh, Paul, as I've said, is open to those uh, participating in WebEx and viewers, on, in our viewers on Facebook. So you may, you may um, choose uh enter your answer now okay uh this is a uh an opinion poll so there is no right or wrong or wrong answer just pick the item that you think is the most serious issue so okay we will close the poll now uh gwen please give us the signal gwen yes ma'am sheila 10 more seconds okay so a is it a fragmented intra-agency or intra-agency coordination b lack of focal units and a and she is for rprh implementation c insufficient number of health staff for rprh d insufficient local funds for rprh implementation or e inadequate communication and education okay so we can close the poll now and we will look at the results later so at this point i invite our uh presenters to and discussants to the open forum our speakers will also be joined by miss joy magas co-author of miss jana oi and Ms. Nordisa nordan co-author of dr pauline sacking okay so let us now look at the questions uh in our um chat box um and we have um a question from mr Gidea uh, Rivera. Okay, let me go back to our, okay, to the virtual floor. May I request all of you to please uh, open your uh, um, videos if it is possible so our audience, our participants can see you. Thank you very much. So our question is from Mr. Gidea Rivera. Um, and I think this was covered by... Uh, Mr. Borling, uh, in his uh, presentation, in his comments, as well as uh, by Sir Deo. Okay, what challenges or opportunities are available for the RPRH implementation considering the Mandanas Garcia ruling on full devolution? Um, okay, uh, who would like to answer this question? Okay, can I go back? To uh, Mr. Borling, and you may want to elaborate the earlier comment you mentioned on the uh, on the uh, possible uh, change that may come uh, from arising from the Mandan arising from the Mandanas ruling in terms of the implementation of the R RPRH law. Ken, yeah, thank you for the question. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you. Okay, I, th I think the discussions I had earlier was the one uh, I got from the research from Dr. Abrigo. Uh, perhaps he could uh, further my explanation later. Um, 
as we all know that the Mandana's ruling is uh, to give the just share to the mm -hmm. LGUs in terms of the national, uh, their share for the national tax allocation. So according to the study uh, done by Dr. Abrigo that uh, with the uh, increasing fiscal space uh, among LGUs that there are more spending for the RPR program services. So mm -hmm. that's how we are seeing um, like the opportunity that we can get from the Mandana's ruling. But that's it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ken. Um, let me go back to uh, uh, Mike. Thank Mike, so would you like to expound on uh, what you presented earlier? Thank you so much, Sheila. Uh, well, uh, I need to nuance uh, some of the results uh, that, that uh, I wasn't able to present, but what uh, is in the paper. Uh, was what could be the likely scenario with the uh, Mandana's ruling and RPRH? Tama yung sinabi ni Ken kanina na based on our analysis that with the expansion of local government income, we, can, we, would, we could expect uh, some better services and then therefore better outcomes uh, on RP uh, reproductive health at the local level. Uh, having said that, uh, we have another paper, an earlier paper, which knew once and bagaling yung um, yung local income, yung LGU, mm -hmm. yung ng LGU. And what we found in that research was that uh, if these um, income is actually generated at the local level, sila mismo from taxes, from their uh, own economic activities, no local government, what we found out was that it results to better antenatal uh, care outcomes. Um, however, with the expansion of, uh, dito? of ERA, so, ang ginawa namin dun is, we looked at LGUs pag nag nag nagawa silang city. Pag naging city yung isang LGU from municipality, biglang tataas yung ira. So, we looked at uh, what happens with their spending. And it turns out, uh, based on that study, uh, hindi sa health napupunta. Uh, if this is a, an exogenous expansion of ERA, napupunta siya sa general services, mm -hmm. sa, uh, sa employment, yung mga ganong klaseng services. Uh, so, so to some extent, uh, this supports yung sinasabi ng ating colleague from Popcom na, na mas green yung, yung kanyang projection uh, with the Mandana's ruling. Having said that, uh, there is some space with this Mandana's ruling na baka merong overflow na from the other services once uh, those uh, local government uh, services are provided for, some of that could spill over dun sa health naman. So hopefully that would happen and that... Uh, that, that this one has ruling would lift the boat, uh, everyone's boat. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, let me go back to Mr. Uh, Deo, uh, because uh, in your comments, you mentioned about uh, the Mandana's uh, possible effect on the Mandana's ruling that it may magnify the role played by the LGUs, um, particularly the uh, difficulties, the uh, weaknesses of the LGUs in terms of. Um, um, implementing or carrying out their default functions, sir. You may want to expound on your on the comments that you uh, mentioned yes. earlier, sir. Deo, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Um, one of the challenges that we think uh, will happen once the Mandana's ruling is implemented is the capacities of LG, LGUs to imp implement the RPR -ish law. That's why APAPCOM created a new division, the Capacity Development and Field Operations Divisions, to address uh, this challenge, ma'am. And uh, we are all also retooling our regional offices uh, with regards to uh, the devolution transition plan. Okay. Thank you for that, um, uh, Mr. Deo. Okay, let us uh, go to another question, this time from one of our Facebook followers. And this is from Mana. Ramirez and uh, her question is is about the loss uh, impact on uh, teen age uh, pregnancy. I think in one of your slides, um, Mike, you you cover this uh, particularly yung key result area on adolescent and youth reproductive health. Uh, you may want to go back to your presentation and probably um, Mike. Yes, I'm here. Yes, yes. Uh, did you hear the question, Mike? Um, the one from, I mentioned from uh, Mana Ramirez, he was asking about the the impact of the law on uh, teenage uh, pregnancy. And I, I, as I've mentioned, you have a slide in your presentation on uh, the key result area on adolescent and youth, youth reproductive health. 
youth uh, and adolescent and youth reproductive health. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, I have one slide, in the, uh, as mentioned by Sheila, this one slide in the adolescent and youth reproductive health, but I cannot say mm -hmm. now this is the impact of okay. RPRH law. Mm -hmm. What we can say is that um, over uh, between 2013 and 2017, during which uh, meron RPRH law, bumaba yung adolescent birth rate, mm -hmm. yung percentage of adolescents who had sexual intercourse before age 15. So whether or not this is because of RPRH law, uh, we cannot mm -hmm. see that right now. But what, what we can say is muabasha, which is a good thing, regardless whether it's because of RPRH law or not. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Mike. Okay. Um, okay, uh, Dr. Milliar in the, or, or can we want to um, provide their input to that question? Since uh, being at the DOH, they have uh, more data on this. Uh, Dr. Milliard, would you like to add something or anything to what uh, Dr. Abrigo has mentioned? Yeah, I think I agree with Dr. Abrigo that uh, that's the result. And actually, we're waiting for the FHSIS result in twenty for this year. So with that, maybe we can uh, calculate or uh, extrapolate more on the, uh, the data or result uh, regarding this KRA. Um, I don't know if uh, Sir Ken would like to add on that, if uh, he has some updated on the uh, updated data. That's all. I think both 2013 and 2017 National Demographic and Health Service showed that age specificity fertility rate for adolescents actually decreased. I think from 57 to 47, so that's 10, 10 point decrease from the last two surveys. Um, we hope to see further reduction by 2022 in the HS, hopefully. Okay, good. Thank you, Ken and uh, uh, Mara. Okay, let's go to um, another question and this time from DJ Orias, okay, one of our WebEx participants. Knowing that budget allocation um, or funds or resources is a problem uh, on how we can implement uh, the program, meaning the RPRH uh, law, what cost-effective measures could be done based, based on your research? Okay. Um, can we hear from uh, Jana? Uh, Jana, would you like to, to, to give your answer to this question? What cost-effective measures could be done based on the research, uh, considering limited resources? Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by cost-effective measures, but um, well, in another case, I think it's not about what interventions, mm -hmm. additional interventions like for RPRH, because that's clearly defined in literature, what are the cost-effective interventions. It's more a matter of the stewardship aspect of the leadership. Um, so for example, Th these findings were similar for an NIP immunization program assessment. And then once the director realized that the resources were far too concentrated in vaccines, uh, she shifted some of the funds to actually hire people. So it's more of, uh, is there a will and mm -hmm. persistence in the department to reallocate funds and notice that the commodities were having too much attention? So the interventions per se are clear already it's just a matter of how you will mm -hmm. guide lgus or give the a so that they can implement also in light of the mandanas ruling uh, that's sort of the job the lg either uh, njas right now because if if you really read the mandates of the njas they're not mandated for service delivery mm -hmm. uh, their mandate is technical assistance and really guidance of lgus mm -hmm. so so an advocacy so that's more apparent in the coming area of universal health care that that's their mm -hmm. role and uh it's going to be a rough thing to, to sort of wrangle all the lgus and convince them that rprh is worth it and, and more specifically why there is primary health care because rprh must be embedded in the, the wider uhc framework um, so i think it's more of that uh, i hope that answers your question thank you very much shana i so uh joy uh mr Ms. Joy Bagas nodding uh, her head. Would you like to uh, provide your inputs, Joy? Hi, Hi Mom Sheila. Maybe I will just add on what Janice said. No? So um, we've, uh, the study highlighted the lack of uh, financing sources for RPRH. 
So um, at the time of our study, we learned no, that our NGAs are really putting an effort to mitigate this um, problem. So they have attempted convergence budgeting because we all we all know that um, this is a multi-sectoral um, advocacy endeavor. So um, it is uh, it is also important to uh, achieve the shared vision. So. Um, one of our um, recommendations in line with stewardship is to have a unified financial plan so mm -hmm. that they can map um, who should be spending for this, who should be spending for that, so that everybody should not is not spending for family planning, for um, for mansion. And um, I'm really happy to hear from Dr. Mara that there have been efforts for streamlining our financing sources. And in line with the question earlier for the Mandanas ruling, because um, what I have said earlier is for the NGAs, for the Mandanas ruling, one of our findings um, in our study is that um, uh, leadership and political priority is very important to secure financing sources. Um, so another recommendation that we have is to include the members of the Union of Local Authorities in the NIT mm -hmm. so that we can... Um, uh let get the buy-in of our um, policy makers both in the national and the local government so that's it okay thank you uh joy uh may, may we also hear from uh dr um uh, uh saki from pauline uh her response to this question in terms of the uh, communication and education component so uh um Pauline, would you have would you like to answer this question of uh, DJ on uh, what do you think are the cost effective measures that we can uh, perhaps that the implementing units and even the LGUs may pursue? Huh? Oh, you did. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, our the. the our studies about communication and education, um, and we didn't, we weren't really able to interview LGU representatives. Mm -hmm. But um, so I don't really know how to answer that question exactly. But you know, in terms of education, there are a lot of things that are budget dependent. So I'm not sure how to become creative in that aspect, but I'm sure there are ways to be cost effective in these measures. But I believe <laughs> that budget is really important to be incorporated here, especially with the need of trainings and with the need for, for people, uh, for um, licensed personnel to be part of this, um, this um, for example, the licensed guidance counselors in the um, the registered nurses who, who who need to be employed in 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 the in the schools and so forth and so on. But I I think what they are doing now is trying to be cost effective already by trying to keep up despite the lack of these. Um, so I guess that's it. Um, I'm not sure if my co-author has something to say about that. Okay. Uh, may we hear from your co-author? If uh, is it, she's around, she may have uh, some inputs to the question. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, yes, sorry, Lisa, go Sheila. ahead. Yes. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Um, well, in terms of uh, cost-effective measures, I, I think the the PIA, for example, with the response of our um, interviewee during the conduct of the study, um, they mentioned about how they maximize their resources, such as um, putting forth their uh, materials for communication through social media. So in terms of communication, they are making use of whatever um, medium uh, is available. So, and as to education, I think Dr. Sacking already mentioned about the trainings and mm -hmm. the National Educators Academy of the Philippines, I think, would also have a portion of their budget that would um, help train our teachers in this uh, comprehensive sexuality education. That would be all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nolisa. Okay. Um, okay. Let us uh, move to another uh, question. Okay, and this time, this this one is from Ed, 
Okay. Edna Estal, okay, one of our WebEx participants, relative to gender-based violence, what are our what are our, the RPRH effective approaches that need inter, interconnected collaboration among the agencies? So Edna is from uh, CWC. Okay, uh, may we hear from our um, discussions from the DOH, uh, Dr. Mara? Would you like to answer this question first? Then I will go to Ken. And this is with regards to gender-based uh, violence. She's asking um, what, what um, RPRH approaches have you found effective that need inter-agency inter or um, inter-agency collaboration? Okay. Dr. Mara? I think I've, I think I've read that to another uh, from their paper. Uh, I'm not sure if I can best answer that one since I don't have the data yet. Mm -hmm. uh, since I've only recently joined the DOH in last year, so I'm not sure if I'll be able to justify the uh, interagency uh, for the GDD. So hopefully my colleague from uh, DOH can join or uh, answer this one. Okay, um, Ken? Would you like to provide your input to this question? Yeah, same as Dr. Mara, because I was, I'm, I'm not actually a part of the like uh, focal for the gender-based violence, but okay. more on the family planning program. So I'm sorry. It's okay. So, uh, okay, let's move to another uh, question. And this one is from Evie. Evie Kabulanan, uh, may we know what agencies track the accomplishment in attaining the key result areas under gender-based violence? Uh, would like to answer this question. Uh, uh, Mike, would you have any idea? Uh, the governance study should be able to, to answer that, Sheila, sorry. Okay, uh, the governance, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, you're involved in the LGU uh, component. Okay, Jana, please. All right. Um, so based on what I remember, it was the PTW who was helping track the cases of gender-based violence back mm -hmm. then. And they were coordinating with the PNP. Mm -hmm. um, so that's Tapos, uh, I guess, to the question of the intervention. From that's the right. Program. Yeah. Um, so back then, parang what they were really having issues was, was if you get a case at the barangay help desk about VAUSI, because there's a law about that, you have to have a violent a VAUSI help desk in the barangay. And then they file a criminal case. What was difficult was referrals from the criminal, uh, parang after processing the case to the health sector. Um, so I guess I'm not sure what's the progress on building that connection. So one of the issues is really how do you harmonize the databases of the PNP and transmit that to Popcom or uh, DOH or the hospitals even? And then how do you aggregate that upwards to national level? So that was really one of the biggest issues, both from the system's perspective of monitoring the progress in that and also in the more practical side of how do you help these women and how do you mm -hmm. Also connect them, say, to not only health but also legal services. So, so, so in that sense, that that shows how RPRH is very connected, and that's why it really needs interagencies because uh, the three agencies, PNP, and then the the, the provide health providers, and then the legal side, and then you might even want to give them mental counseling, etc. So, so that is an example of how you want services, a benefit package, to be really integrated, and why it needs to cross sectors. I hope mm -hmm. I answered the question. Thank you, uh, Jana. Um, okay, Joy, I, I, I saw you not, nodding your head, uh, head again. Uh, would you like to yeah. uh, provide your inputs? I'll just add again to what Jana said. So after after having going through that process, no, the SW also has a program wherein they are giving fin assistance to individuals in crisis situations, and that includes women and children. So I think that's the different programs that needs uh, cohesiveness and collaboration mm -hmm. among different agencies. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Joy. Okay, let's uh, go to another question. This time it's from Charles. Charles Andrew Bautista, given the evolving policies around the universal health care, the Mandanis ruling on top of the RPRH law, what is your recommendation on how the role of each agency should evolve moving forward? Uh, in particular, the NGAs and their oversight role um, to LGUs. Okay. Um, uh, Jana? Would you like to answer this since you cover the uh, the uh, national level governance? All right. Um, so hopefully the, the the national agency. So I can only speak the, from for the OH side because the OH is my expertise. Yeah. Um, hopefully, so so based on just parang talking to the program managers, the past difficulties which I did not cover in my side is really that they have limited staff to sort of help with the TAs going down versus the LGU. So, for example, each program only usually has two two persons managing the entire program nationally at the, the central office level, uh, one one plantilla position, even just one JO. So, so in one aspect, to strengthen the TA section is really to have more people and, mm -hmm. as soon, and, and letting go slowly of the procurement for the commodities because the mandala will force them to actually do it because the money will be taken away from from the national level so hopefully that shift they can go back to focusing on the TAs um mm -hmm. but uh, uh, because honestly the, the procurement really takes a lot of energy uh, if you talk to the pms and then mm -hmm. all the admin matters for that so hopefully that will be one of the positive effects that the the, the people at the national will really be freed up to focus on TA. But then I guess it goes beyond that because if you look at the structure of the Philippine government in its delivery of service services, public services, it's really very heavy. And I mean, I honestly don't know how to fix it. <laughs> but uh, if you look at how the parallel structures go down from national to regional to local, provincial to municipal to barangay, mm -hmm. it's really a challenge to streamline it and to manage it upward, upwards. And, and and then I don't know what else to say, but this really really needs to be a lot of capacity building, not just at the national, but in all levels of the the administration, uh, because the parang the plague of lack of HR and technical capacity spans across it. Parang I don't see how we can fix it if you can't you can't have good people at each level and sufficient people with sufficient budget. So uh, not really an answer, but really more of musings. Uh, this is the problem of the health system reform at the moment. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Jana. At this point, let's have a short break so we can give our uh, um, speakers uh, some time to breathe. Let's go to the results of our poll. Uh, Gwen, can you flash... Flash the results, please. So, uh, okay, going back to the question, if you will remember, if you, uh, you'll recall, the question was um, among the implementation issues reported in the presentations, which is the most serious and in need of immediate attention. So, let us look at the results of our poll. So, uh, the topmost answer was a fragmented intra agency and interagency uh, coordination followed by insufficient uh, number of uh, health staff of local health staff then third is insufficient uh, local funding for rprh services okay so thank you very much for those who um um participated in our uh Paul. So as a token of our appreciation, we will pick two names uh, from WebEx and two from from Facebook and uh, we will give them a prize and I will announce the winners uh, later. Okay, so let us go back to our Q&A and uh, we have a question from, okay, from, um, let me go back. Okay, this one is from Oli Lucas. So uh, this is about our LGUs. Okay, so in the LGUs where our RPRH programs launch, their health departments, the youth coordinator's office, or the local social welfare office. Uh, what is the OH approaching 
uh, promoting the devolved RPRH programs. Okay, um, may we hear from uh, from Mike? Okay. Uh, Thank you so much, Sheila. Thank you so much, um, Oli, for the question. Uh, well, mm -hmm. these RPRH services were actually part of the services that are provided by the LGUs even before the RPRH law was passed. So uh, it's everywhere. It's in the so yung mga health services they are in the uh, health centers yung kanilang social municipal provincial city social work uh, welfare uh, offices uh, they do yung, yung sa children some of the, the services for children uh, violence against women with, with the local police so yung buong local government actually uh, provides mm -hmm. services uh, regarding our PRH. okay thank you very much mike and uh, we have um Let's move to another question this time from one of our Facebook followers, uh, Facebook viewers, Alphonse Rafael uh, Guevara. The Bandanas ruling presents an opportunity for increased funding or LGUs, and the hope is that this can be translated into organic augmentation of, of um, health, of uh, human resources for health. For the researchers, are there studies supporting the assumption that increased funding uh, translates to more HRH? For NGAs, are there policy safeguards within DOH or PAPCOM to make sure that LGUs follow through? Okay, Mike, uh, may I uh, throw this question to you given your studies on the HRH? Okay, uh, thank you so much, Sheila. Thank you, Alphonse, for the question. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, kailang inuwas natin sa ngaling yung uh, pera ng LGU if it's uh, from the local government itself, from, from, from its taxes. So, pag from if it's locally sourced, it means the whole economy is rising. Then uh, that means uh, it's actually better. Uh, they are able to provide more services better than you, uh, at, at least your antenatal care outcomes. But uh, in, in another study, we, we found uh, if it's from ERA, it's not necessary. The, the, these expansion of local funds do not necessarily go to health services. So more likely, it's going to go education, manpower, mm -hmm. general services. On uh, HRH, well, uh, there is some possibility with expansion of uh, local income that it could go to HRH. But uh, having said that, kung walang uh, doctor, nurse, midwives, mm -hmm. LGUs, more likely wala rin silang engineers, wala rin silang mga planners. So, so hindi lang HRH ang problema nila. And in our study on uh, on the tao dito, yung deployment program ng HRH. Uh, the problem really is not just uh, getting uh, doctors in the market. Because mm -hmm. for many of these locations, walang doctor na makukuha. Even if you post na you want, you, you need doctors and ito yung kita nila, uh, there's a high chance if this is uh, GIDA, walang mag apply that, That's why uh -huh. you need the national government to do that. Uh, one one also re one result also of that study is that uh, what we found out was that even if uh, nag deploy ka ng, ano doon, ng doctors uh, after the uh, deployment after the, their contract with GOH, kahit offer mo sila ng same na level ng ano na compensation they would 60% of these uh, doctors would rather uh, leave and do something else so it's not just about having the money uh, mm -hmm. to to procure these services but also the local market for these uh, services thank you very much uh, mike and let us go to the second part of the question uh, and may i throw this to the oh and popcom are there policy safeguards within the oh or popcom to make sure that lgus follow through and uh, he this uh, second part of the question uh, refers to um, the organic augmentation of the HRH, uh, which may result or uh, arising from the uh, from the implementation of the Mandanas ruling. Um, may we hear from uh, Mara or Ken, Doctor Mara? Sorry, what was the question again? Augmenting okay. age? Yes, okay. yes. Um, uh, from Alphonse Guevara, this is actually the second part of, her, of his question. So he is asking if there are policy safeguards within the OH to make sure that LGUs follow through. He is referring to the possible um, okay. organic augmentation of HRH as a result of um, the implementation of the Mandanas ruling. 
Okay, so we already prepared a DTP. So I think, uh, sorry, but I cannot provide all the details for the DTP. But yes, we already mm -hmm. had a uh, DTP as, as well as Popcom. They, uh, they prepared the DTP for or the devolution transition plan. So hopefully this will be uh, handled or captured in this uh, uh, in terms of planning and budgeting. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, this is in consideration for the Mandan's, Mandana's ruling. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mara. And uh, Sir Deo, would you like to provide your input to this question, sir? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, similar to Dr. Mara, we, we also have the DTP. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, DTP, uh, there's, there are uh, provisions there that uh, will address these issues, particularly on capacitating LGUs with regards to uh, family planning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Deo. So we are down to our last question, and this one is from Rochelle Aguilar, one of our WebEx participants. So, and this one is, uh, she said, especially for LGUs, how much, of a, how much of a factor is the issue of accountability or the lack of it affecting the implementation of the RPRH law? Um, Mike, would you like to, to uh, answer this question? Thank you so much, Sheila. Thank you so much, Rochelle, for the question. Well, it, it's not so much about accountability, but uh, the workload. So yung accountability usually dito, uh, yung mga services na yun, napupunta dun sa municipal health officer, city health officer, the provincial health officer. But for the most part, dun sa mga nakausap namin sa FGDs, KIIs, and in the surveys, uh, nahihirapan sila na, 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 na ibigay lahat ng services. Una, uh, limited funds. Pangalawa, limited yung mga tao. So, and, and hindi lang RPRH services yung binibigay nila. There's a lot of services there mm -hmm. that we are doing. So, and on the That's one right. hand, they have these frontline services that they need to provide services to people. But then, uh, merong, merong backroom kasi ng mga kailangan silang gawin. Marami silang report na kailangan ipasa. And, and, and one of, uh, isa sa mga kwento na nakuha namin during the FGDs KIIs was that, actually, yung sabi nila, yung daw pinapadala ng... Uh, DOH mga tao. Ito lang din yung gumagawa ng mga dagdag na trabaho na binibigay ng DOH. So, there are a lot of things that LJUs are doing. And I guess, uh, it's, it's a great disservice to sa mga tao na sa baba na we are, we are asking a lot of them na it's taking away uh, resources, time uh, to providing actual services to people. Thank you, Mike. And I think you uh, mentioned in your presentation and you may ex uh, expound a bit on this, that during, uh, during this pandemic, no? Well, as we all know, LGUs are at the front front of uh, service delivery and uh, there has been um, an effect on uh, their delivery of RTRH services, means yung iba natigil or yung iba to totally uh, nahinto yung, ano, yung uh, delivery nila ng RTRH services. Mike? Uh, yes, we asked that in the survey. So we asked them, uh, na, during, na, on a regular day, did, did they provide these services? And during this time, during the pandemic, uh, that was mid-2020, uh, mm -hmm. no, no more scare natin sa, sa COVID, mm -hmm. uh, are they provide, is providing these services? And some of those, uh, actually, tinanggal nila yung mga services na yan. So mm -hmm. uh, on a regular day, some of these services they do not provide. Pero during that time, uh, naghinturing sila. Uh, a good thing to note though is that there are some, ano, there are some LGUs naman na nagsabi na while uh, they do not provide these services kasi nga uh, natakpan sila nung COVID, they have other means na i-provide naman to. So, merong mga ilan-ilang mga LGUs and, and these are bright spots uh, in the study na they actually uh, go house to house to provide these services. So, so mm -hmm. that, instead of uh, waiting for these people to go to the health centers, they go to the people, uh, mm -hmm. through their uh, barangay health workers and, and other staff. Yeah, okay. So, maraming mga innovative approaches then, no? Uh, on uh, health service delivery ang nakita natin during this pandemic. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Mike. And let's have one more question. Uh, this, is already, this is the final one. Okay, and this is from Rochelle Aguilar. Um, okay. Uh, okay, oh, we have two. Okay. Uh, let me go first to Patricia's, uh, Patricia Gomez's question. Uh, these are perennial issues. 
Um, and he, she was referring to lack of health staff, insufficient training and funding. How effective are these laws policies in addressing these issues? Um, I'm not sure if she's referring mainly or um, uh, solely to uh, the RPRH because there are other programs of uh, the government of the DOH that are addressing, let's say, the lack of health staff, um, etc. So, okay. May we hear from um, our discussions from the DOH? Hi, hello. Uh, yes. So, thank you. I, I think um, this, I can only speak for the family planning or at least in the RPRH. And I've mentioned a while ago that we're creating a multisectoral planning. And in the governance study uh, presented by Dr. Jana, it was shown that it's very important there is stewardship and then there's coordination so i think with uh handling or tackling first the to capture this create the creation of the core team which are supposed to be a very close to each other they would be champions advocates for the rprh implementation there would be a smaller group that would be easier to build relationship with each other and and these champions will be able to lay out all the uh needed contribution towards the, its implementation and and it will serve as a guide to one another so we'll be able to uh, uh make the make use of their limited resources and all uh, the bottlenecks um you know be able to address them uh, properly and you know that uh, with the limited time as well and we can identify the best arrangement and um yeah, streamlining basically the NIT. So we are, we have identified, we are identifying this, uh, we have identified this core team. And then later on, uh, the output would be a uh, multi sectoral uh, plan. So we'll have a framework and the MN. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's all. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mara. Okay. So uh, this is our last question uh, from Rochelle. Wouldn't the low response rate of the LGU studies survey reflect on how much importance certain LGUs put on the issue of RPRH law implementation? May I throw this uh, to Mike? Well, Mike mentioned earlier that uh, when they conducted the study, this this was at the height of also of the pandemic. Uh, so it, it's also one of the reasons, according to Mike, that have that um, uh, affected the. Uh, the uh the turnout of um, um the survey okay mike please uh, yes uh sheila that, that's true and actually we need to provide context kung bakit that's right the mm -hmm. yung survey response and then yung nga naman yung panahon na yung kasagsagan nung scare natin sa covid actually it's not because uh ano, we actually followed up with these uh, offices mm -hmm. and uh, ang goal and target respondents namin dito are yung mga health officers because they know much of the of the, the things going on with the RPRH at the local level. Unfortunately, during that time, hindi nila mabigay yung oras nila for these surveys right. because mm -hmm. the survey was quite comprehensive and it requires mm -hmm. a lot of time on their part, the, uh, part time that they could have given to, to COVID response. So, so mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't fault them uh, for having uh, not responded mm -hmm. to that uh, survey. Thank you very much, Mike. So we now close the open forum and uh, to cap our discussion, may I ask each speaker for their uh, brief uh, final remarks. So we start uh, from uh, Jana uh, to be followed by uh, Dr. Mike Abrigo and Dr. Uh, Pauline uh, Saking. Uh, you may give your remarks on behalf of your co-authors. And of course, we will also hear from Dr. Uh, Miliar, uh, Mr. Ken Borling, and Mr. Uh, Hilvano. Okay, Jana, you may proceed. All right, thanks, Mom Sheila. Uh, I guess last remarks is just, um, so So these problems in RPRH, they're, they're everywhere in all the programs. So it's a much bigger issue. And I hope uh, at least we gave you a taste of what it looks like to work in health reform in this country. So there's a lot of problems the national are, is aware um, and, um, and and really, it's the battle is in the LGU also, not just at the national level. So, uh, well, uh, hope <laughs> they will good luck to us in the next <laughs> coming years. Uh, we'll we'll keep working on uh, make helping make you easier uh, reality. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jana, and to your co-authors as well. Uh, 
Mike? Thank you so much, Sheila. Well, I just want to emphasize that RPR RPRH law is a success. Um, kahit mm -hmm. na meron tayong mga challenges with the implementation, having that framework, uh, solidifying, codifying these, uh, ano ba na, these dreams of having these RPRH uh, services and goods and, uh, and provided to our uh, people, that in itself is a success. So I guess we need to work more on having that dream a reality. And, and maybe in the future, we would have it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Mike and also to your co-authors. And uh, maybe hear from uh, Dr. Pauline Saking. Pauline, go ahead. Yes, um, I would like to make use of the time by uh, to react on a comment given by by um, one of our um, attendees in WebEx, just sharing my opinion based on experience, hesitancy for, of some schools and LGU officials and lack of support in the conduct of CSE due to biased personal opinion on the matter. That would be true. But um, my response to this really is, look at the the poll results. The lowest, uh, the lowest that uh, the lowest um, responses um, were given to inadequate communication and education. But if you look at it, the solution to this problem is really communication and education. So it's really important that education, because with communication, we, we also educate people. So it's very important that these components of RPRH be addressed as well in order to start them young as well, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to educate them young. And of course, even the teachers have to be trained. And so everything should be put in place. And that's, I think, why I have to comment on that. Program. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saking Pauline, for um, covering that uh, question and also to your um, co-author, Norlisa Nordan. Okay, and we, we also hear from our discussants, uh, Dr. Mara uh, and, and Ken. Yeah, so um, I'm very thankful to be here and I really appreciate hearing the our authors of this assessment and I would like to say that yes, uh, I, I do agree that the RPH not really, you know, um, parang yung mga uh, problems natin dito is hindi siya black and white, no? Hindi siya parang automatic, alam mo na yung sagot. It's really hard to identify how we can handle this. But this is a very good step Now we are starting na to identify that there are really, uh, we are recognizing that there are problems na we need to look at. And it's good that with this speeds um, assessment, we are we come to realize and develop the concept of the multi-sectoral planning. And the main goal is that to understand what are the really the goals of uh, roles of the NGAs, what are the successes, uh, achievements, and bottle um as uh, uh, enabling factors. And then with the goal of uh, we envision that we we can achieve a universal access for RPR services and that ultimately, you know, uh, makuha natin yung hinahanap nating ideal na RPRH. So yeah, that's it for me. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to Mara. Okay, and I'll maybe hear from Ken. Yeah, um, as our researchers mentioned, no, that these studies are an early attempt to assess the implementation of the RPRH law. It's programs, services, and mandates in the country since its passage in 2012. But I think the most important intention of these studies, no, why the DOH funded this um, uh, third-party study through the PIDS, is to guide the department and, and identifying gaps or areas for improvement in the RPH implementation and um, ano, um, dedication of the department no, uh, towards fulfilling nung kanyang obligation to the Filipino people. I think this is the start. Thank you. Thank you, too, Ken. Okay, and we here from uh, Mr. De Hilvan of Popcom. Sir, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, webinar and also thank you for the speakers for the papers. Uh, RPRH is an important factor for, develop for development. There is a need for convergence of all efforts of government of agencies to fill all the gaps and overcome all challenges in ensuring that this law will succeed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deo. Friends, uh, please join me in uh, acknowledging all our presenters uh, in our discussions uh, for uh, the uh, valuable insights that they uh, have shared with us this afternoon. Let us give all of them a well-deserved big virtual clap. And uh, before we finally close, I would like to announce the winners of our poll. 
Okay, they are uh, from Webex, uh, Rochelle Aguilar and Jasper Manlina. And from Facebook, Alphonse Rafael Guevara and Didi Abola Vega. So to all our winners, I will, our webinar team will get in touch with you for the delivery of your prize. And finally, we have some reminders. Okay, so um, you can access all the presentations from today's uh, webinar from the PIDS uh, website and flash on the screen are the links to the full studies which you can download uh, uh, from our website and we will also um, upload the uh, the comments uh, of our uh, discussions if, uh, if possible. Okay, and also please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. We will also email you after the event. Your comments are important to us to improve our uh, virtual events. And please uh, regularly visit um, our website and social media pages. Again, thank you to all those who um, watch uh, the live stream of this event on our Facebook page and those who followed the live uh, tweets uh, on our Twitter account. And we have a YouTube channel where you can um, view the recording of this webinar as well as our past uh, webinars and face-to-face -face seminars uh, prior to the pandemic, okay? And flash on the screen is our last webinar for the month of May. So next week, we will have the virtual launch of the PIDS book, The Philippines Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic, Learning from Experience and Emerging Stronger to Future Shocks. That will be uh, same time, 2 p.m. to 4.30 uh, p.m. via Cisco WebEx. Please do um, uh, register to this event. Uh, we will um, uh, promote it. We will uh, share it on our Facebook page uh, tomorrow. Okay. And finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academe, civil society, business, and international development community uh, who join us today. So this concludes our webinar for today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you, and see you next week. Maraming salamat po.